This is intentional. This is intentional. There's a level of intentionality here. I don't think this could be a mistake. Of these bodies uh, without doing proper- Yeah, why not cite the- Why would he- God, he's so stupid! Did he just say they- 100% a case of projection as well. Ah, uh, the ranks were a projection from our proud days of Leahy and Irgun military dominance. I mean, you know, a lot of people have been saying for a long time that, uh, you know, that the, uh, the accusation is the confession, in a, you know, you <laughs> know. The accus- the I No, what? It had- this was not an evaluation of Israel's conduct. Very specifically- oh, I can't- okay, it is intentional. It is intentional and these people are evil. I can't- I can't- I don't- I can't- I can't fact check every single claim. It, like, every single thing said is like a lie. This is like unhinged. What's your professional opinion on why lefties like Azan feel they need to literally engage in- Apologia for what seems like the most obvious open and shut case like October 7th. Remember, the narrative is Palestinians are fighting back because of unfair and unjust oppression by the oppressors. So as part of that narrative, there's two parts that are really important. One is all bad things that the lower party, the oppressed party does is because of the oppression, okay? That's number one. And number two, is that it's kind of in line with number one. Number two is that oppressed people are always good people, but if there is any badness about them, that's only attributable to the oppression. <laughs> These, they don't say to, but it seems to be the case. So when October 7th happens, do people get killed? Sure. Hostages taken? I mean, yeah, they're oppressed. Like you can go down the line, all these things. Rape as like the tool of the oppressed, that's a hard one. <laughs> Uh, I don't think you can accept right. There's too much cognitive dissonance. So you either have to rewrite the narrative on like, okay, well, f maybe there's something a little bit more to this than oppressor or oppressee. That's impossible. Um, so remember, the way that you resolve cognitive dissonance, if you can't change your understanding, you have to change the facts. So the understanding can't change. For most people, unfortunately, that's the case. So then it becomes a fact of um, cherry picking. Okay, well, the didn't happen. Boom. And then it's easy. And then the not happening also conveniently fits um, other narratives of like, well, obviously the rapes didn't happen because the, um, the rapes didn't happen because the, um, uh, cause the idea flies. Israel lied. They all lied. They're liars. Obviously. I will say, I don't know what the f the point is of third party investigatory bodies. <laughs> I don't know what the f the point is of like the UN and the whatever, because it seems like all they are is a mouthpiece for whoever they interview. Now, let me caution. I didn't actually read the UN review of October 7th, but it looks like it's essentially them, I'm, I'm gonna say parroting, but that sounds mean, but like it's basically them parroting whatever um, the medical investigators and the IDF people already told them. But then on the flip side, whenever the like, you know, Amnesty International, the UN does investigations in Palestine, it's just them parroting whatever Hamas tells them or the Palestinian Health Authority. I don't know what the f point is of these third party bodies that come in and all they do is they interview the people already there who give the same answers that they gave to their official reporting bodies themselves. It's like, well, what the f is the point of any of this? Like, why? I don't know. That now that being said, I'll, let me hedge that. I haven't read the report thing, so the clearly happened. The question is, do you think there is evidence of systemic rape or planned rape by Hamas? Um, oh, I'm trying to think if I don't know if in general if I associate like Islamic extremism with mass rapes. I'm trying to, because I don't, I feel like I don't remember ISIS doing that. They could have, and I just don't remember. Here we go. Let's see what they have to say about the UN's report. Uh, some of the social media likes of Anat Schwartz, one of the people who's bylined on the piece that no one had ever heard of. Um, and it turned out that she had liked a number of tweets that really were, you know, not just dehumanizing Palestinians, but in fact, she liked one tweet that called for turning Gaza into a slaughterhouse and dispensing with any rules of engagement and you know, raising it to the ground. And that tweet, um, in fact, was cited in South Africa's case at the International Court of Justice as um, genocidal incitement um, speech. So the, the, and then there were a number of other ones. She also uh, liked the tweet that promoted the lie that there were 40 babies beheaded on October 7th. And on the tweet that she liked, I didn't see anything relating to 40 beheaded babies. He's drawing from the squirrel here. She also liked posts repeating the 40 beheaded babies hoax. This is unbelievable. But the tweet that she liked says 40 babies murdered. Unless the video itself says 40 beheaded babies. Does the video say it? The tweet that she liked in the video, they mentioned the beheaded baby. Oh, okay, maybe in the video they did then. But I can't see the... 
Is this in English? It's hard to even explain exactly just the mass casualties that happened right here. In fact, the Israeli military says they still don't have a clear number, but I'm talking to some of the soldiers and they say what they've witnessed as they've been walking through these different houses, these different communities, uh, babies, their heads cut off. That's what they said. Gunned down, families completely gunned down in their beds. You can see some of these soldiers right now comforting each other. Many of them reserves uh, who jumped into action, leaving their own families behind as well, not knowing the sheer horror that they were about to come to. They say they've never experienced anything like this. This is nothing that anyone could have even imagined when you're walking through here. Baby cribs thrown to the side. Doors thrown wide open. Still okay, this is a little bit better then. But this was also news that was on October 10th. Like, is it was it really that unbelievable? Like, how many of these retards still to to this day believe that the um al aliyah or whatever hospital was literally being missile struck by by an israeli jdam it didn't say 40 though wait did it hold on let me check it's hard wait hold on let me listen to this whole thing to even explain exactly just the mass casualties that happened right here in fact the israeli military says they still don't have a clear number but i'm talking to some of the soldiers and they say what they've witnessed as they've been walking through these different houses these different communities uh babies their heads cut off that's what they said Gunned down, families completely gunned down in their beds. You oh. can see some of these soldiers right now comforting each other. Many of them reserves uh, who jumped into action, leaving their own families behind as well, not knowing the sheer horror that they were about to come to. They say they've never experienced anything like this. This is nothing that anyone could have even imagined when you're walking through here. Baby cribs thrown to the side. Doors thrown wide open. Still some Israeli bodies still here because the fighting in this community just ended uh, just, just recently. So many of these troops are still going house to house, door to door. It's taking them sometimes 30 minutes, 40 minutes because many of these houses are also uh, still have grenades in them, booby traps. In fact, as we're trying to get closer to some of these scenes, we're being told, no, 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 get back from some of these Israeli military because there are still grenades in the area. I want us to keep walking through, continue to kind of see the destruction that's happening on the ground here. Even something as simple as, as a soccer net just left to the side here as people were with their families uh, playing. I see in the distance more bodies being covered. Uh, all, all the while as they're covering these Israeli bodies trying to evacuate everyone else from the, the territory, taking all the casualties out of here. It's also littered with the bodies of terrorists. So we're hearing from one of the lead commanders here. There's anywhere from maybe 70 armed terrorists who made their way here from the Gaza border fence, uh, which is less than a quarter of a mile away. And as I said, the atrocities that they committed, uh, violence with guns, with grenades, with knives, uh, targeting these innocent civilians inside their homes. Um, so the soldiers here, it's a very, very difficult for scene for them as well. As I said, leaving their families behind, but they say they will continue to be here, continue to to kill every terrorist who is in the area. You can hear we're very, very close to the Gaza Strip, so we continue to hear artillery firing overhead as well. Uh, even as we were giving the story, we were told to get all around and take cover um, because you actually, because you're so close to the strip right now, you don't even get the red alert, you actually hear the boom before you're even told to get to the ground. So. It's, this is the reality, and this is what all these soldiers, you can see, none of them expecting this, but all of them being here, ready for the fight, nonetheless, and, and proud to fight uh, for, for their country is what, what I'm hearing as well, and so that's why they want to show the press, they want to show these very, very difficult images, David, but they want everyone else. Is there any evidence for any beheaded babies? Um, I, there might have been for one. Let me double check real quick. Although I don't know if it would have shown up in the... Oh, wait, it would be decapitated? It says decapitation. I don't know if they mentioned decapitation of babies in this, though. I don't think they mentioned the age for anything here. The idea that she's, like, trying to specifically spread, like, the 40 beheaded babies hoax, though, when she's literally, like, just retweeting, like, on the ground live reporting of the day... That's like, this is an unhinged take. Bro, there's nothing like, I mean, like, should she, I, I don't even know if I would ascribe a level of responsibility. It's like, well, make sure when you're retweeting, like, news coming out, like, the day, the days after, uh, that, it, like, the on the ground report, like, there's no way that she could verify any of this. There's, like, the entire world was finding out in the days that followed, like, what the f was actually happening. Nobody actually had an idea. Another one that said that, you know, Hamas is, is Daesh, is ISIS. Um, and, uh, and so this is one of the people that then is bylined on this New York Times piece. So, um, you know, we also, we, we saw those social media posts and, and at the same time- And notice how ass mad they got when there was an editor's note that was attached to that disgusting fucking poet who was talking about how, um, what he made the joke about like where the babies in the oven being cooked with baking powder and he was making, um, Oh God, fuck, I'm trying to remember the most disgusting shit. There was so much unhinged shit this guy was fucking tweeting after October 7th. And they were so mad when people brought up that like, hey, maybe it's not fair to say that this guy was some like pro-Israeli Palestinian who's trying to bridge the gap between Israeli and Palestinian poetry when it was pretty clear this guy fucking hates Israelis, at least, if not Jews, right? Like they were ultra ass mad when people tried to make sure they're like, hey, here's that reputation. And now they're trying to impugn some Jews reputation based on tweets she was making on October 7th through 10th of just like reporting on the ground. That's unhinged. 
time, we um, we were working with some people inside Israel to dig around uh, what you know what had been um, what, what what might be knowable about how this New York Times piece um, started. And we came across um, a podcast interview in Hebrew that Anat Schwartz had given in early January, so just a few days after the piece came out, with um, Channel 12, one of the biggest corporate uh, TV networks in Israel. But it's a podcast, and you know it's, it wasn't like a huge thing. So we quickly got that thing translated, and we made sure to get it reviewed. Hold on. But aren't you the one who cautions to just wait for more information to come out? That we shouldn't trust 30 second video clips? Not saying your take is wrong, but doesn't it cut both ways? New orgs need to wait before reporting stuff. Yes, that is my take, you retarded subhuman fing knuckle dragging dipshit. Have you ever breathed through your nose in your entire fing life? That's the standard that I would set for like a journalist or hopefully somebody in my position. But for like a random, like this woman is like a fing like independently contracted person that helped with the story. I don't even know what her overall background journalistic like thing is. But this isn't her reporting, bro. She's not writing articles reporting this. This is probably her engaging in Twitter as a civilian, like seeing shit coming out and then retweeting it. I'm not gonna hold every, I'm sure if we went through every single fucking reporter's shit and was like saying, what did you report after a fucking, or what did you retweet after a terrorist attack? And then hold that as like some, on the same journalistic standard that I would to like news being reported. Dude, that's such an unbelievably retarded fucking comparison. Like, well, hold on, would you put that in a news article? No, but I'm not, that's not the, the standard that I'm using to evaluate a person's social media days after a terrorist attack. That's unhinged. Or if you want to say that, that's fine. But if you take that standard, you better have the same fucking standard for every unhinged thing you ever see a Palestinian say. Like, you can't on one hand say, well, on October 10th, they like this tweet, so they're a terrorist. And then in the next breath go, here's my 42-point essay for why the, the Houthi slogan of death to America, death to Israel, death to the Jews isn't actually that bad. I can't believe I just got triggered by such a retarded question. If you're lucky, I don't have your name in chat anymore. View the translation reviewed by three separate Hebrew speakers because we wanted to be, we wanted to make sure it was accurate because the contents of it were incendiary. Um, so we had, we ran it through three translation reviewed by three Israel, but it's a podcast and you know, it's, it wasn't like a huge thing. So we quickly got that thing translated and we made sure to get it reviewed, the translation reviewed by three separate Hebrew speakers because we wanted to be, we wanted to make sure it was accurate because the contents of it were incendiary. Um, so we had, we ran it through three separate Hebrew translations to make sure that we were going to use the most generous translation because, you know, translation, you can choose how to make somebody sound. We don't want to make it short sound like a cave person. So um, I'm just, I'm sharing with, with folks on the stream that we really went out of our way to try to make sure that everything we did was accurate because what, what the contents of this was a nut Schwartz for basically an hour detailing every, you know, step of how they proceeded to quote unquote report this story. And, you know, she says on it that she did 150 interviews um, and makes really clear that Jeffrey Gettleman, despite the fact that he was the, you know, the, the top dog in charge, had essentially farmed out the reporting on an incredibly consequential investigation to Anat Schwartz, a filmmaker with no reporting experience whatsoever. And then the nephew of Anat Schwartz's life partner, uh, they're not married, but um, his nephew, um, Adam Sella, who basically was kind of like a food blogger or a culture journalist and, um, you know, no insult to him. I mean, we looked into him. I mean, he was, he's, a, he's a kid, basically, who wants to get into journalism. He started doing some... It was an incendiary interview because she farmed out the reporting or because Gettleman, didn't Gettleman, isn't it said here that Gettleman's job was essentially to be like the writer, that that was his, his goal was to do the writing, her goal was to collect all of the information. I, bro, these people are, this is intentional. This is intentional. There's a level of intentionality here. I, I, I think there's like an evilness at play. I don't think this could be a mistake. There's no way. Even from the quotes that they, they gave from that, um, the way they describe that podcast as incendiary and the quotes that they give don't make it sound like that at all. It sounds like she went through the comprehensive process of like how they went about, um, like how they went about writing the, the piece, like what the whole process was for gathering information. Freelance pieces. He actually wrote a couple pieces for Al Jazeera. He was starting to get into more, you know, news reporting, not just food and culture that he had been doing earlier. And, um, you know, our understanding is that uh, the, from Ben Smith uh, reported this, that Patrick Kingsley, the bureau chief of the New York Times in Jerusalem, had introduced Jeffrey Gettleman to Adam Sella, and, and, and that seems to be how Anat Schwartz ended up in this. I'm going into this detail, it'll matter later, but so you assemble this, uh, not the A team, not the B team, not the C team, but the totally inexperienced team to run an investigation for the most important news organization on the planet into uh, assertions that Hamas had uh, weaponized systematic uh, sexual assault and rape against um, Jewish women. Can so I, they embark can on their- I have a question here, really quickly. Uh, no. Under other circumstances, under normal circumstances, I, I, if I'm being as charitable as possible to the paper record, um, would they not have been able to tap into actual Israeli journalists who do a phenomenal yeah. job in investigative reporting? Because you have, uh, I think it's plus 972. Stop. When he says tap into actual Israeli journalists, what he mean is exclusively the most extreme writers that they could find that work with uh, Haaretz or people that work with Bet Salem or Palestinian journalists. That's what he means when he says that. Don't ever be confused there. He's not talking about people that write for a tablet. He's not talking about people that even probably do Times of Israel or whatever the else. He's exclusively talking about the most unhinged pro-Palestinian writers that exist in that country. 100%. You mag, you have uh, reporters at Haaretz, you have reporters at Ynet who are yeah, not even uh, ideologically aligned with uh, anti-Zionism even at all, and yet have done pretty solid work on even exposing Zakat, for example. Both Ynet and Haaretz have, have written articles, uh, numerous articles at this point, uh, basically talking about the exaggerated claims from Zakat members and how they lacked uh, any kind of 
um, forensic uh, uh, criminology, uh, forensic pathology experience where they basically discarded some of these bodies uh, without doing proper- Yeah, why not cite the, why would he, God, he's so stupid. Did he just say they discarded the bodies? Was that the word that he used? I'm sorry, we gotta go through. That couldn't, I misheard. I'm going too fast, I'm sorry. Forensic uh, uh, criminology, uh, forensic pathology experience where they basically discarded some of these bodies uh, without doing proper investigative uh, work that was an absolute necessity. Uh, like, I mean, there are other journalists out there, right? That they That's, that isn't the claim. You actual fucking buffoon. I don't think he's read a single fucking thing really on the entirety of Israel-Palestine. I'm sorry, with the exception of tweets, okay? And I'm sure if we scroll up here, you can see where you can see where he researches from, okay? You know where the information comes from, okay? Sorry, little bro. You wanna shit on me for reading Wikipedia all day? This doesn't count as research, okay? Holy shit. My God. The, the, the issues with Zaka and the reason why they don't collect forensic evidence is because it's a religious group that shows up to help bury bodies and collect body parts in accordance with religious customs not because they're discarding the body discard and the english connotations with that i understand that for this guy english is like his third language with i guess turkish being his second and absolute down syndrome retard being language number one okay the point of of, of zaka is not to collect forensic evidence and it's not to investigate sites right that's the whole issue with them showing up and doing it it's not because they were discarding bodies the connotation for that is incredibly negative and disrespectful it's because they were being respectful to bodies that was the issue it was the respect part they should have been disrespectful they should have taken the bodies to a forensic investigator and taken pictures of naked people instead of trying to be respectful that's the issue they could have uh, basically utilized as freelancers that would have loved to get a new york times byline there's, there's two ways yeah i mean you know as somebody who's done a lot of um international reporting and um reporting on on really sensitive issues. I mean, back in Afghanistan, I did an investigation into a U.S. military special operations raid where two pregnant women were uh, were killed along with other people in a raid by the Joint Special Operations Command where the U.S. soldiers dug the bullets out of the bodies of the pregnant women to try to cover up that it was American munitions. And of course, you know, I don't speak any of the languages um, indigenous. It's, it's, I don't, I just don't believe anything. Now, if I hear that story in the view, I'm just going to assume this never happened. I'm going to assume American soldiers never killed a single Afghanistan just by hearing him say it. I, this is how little I trust these people or how much I trust them to get it intentionally wrong. Jesus, sorry. That story might be true. I truly don't know. I have no, um, I have no basis to, to analyze or evaluate. This to Afghanistan, so I also had to work with local people. But there's two ways you can approach this as a journalist, and the Times chose neither of them. One is you can work with experienced local journalists, and um, and you're working, you're you're working with them, and um, you, you're sort of you're a team. Um, or you can work with people that are less experienced, or people that are sort of called, you know, sometimes called fixers. You know, they're they're people that, that help facilitate the gathering of news and information. And 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 if you're if you're going down that path where you're not working with another experienced journalist, the the correspondent who is experienced has to oversee the whole thing. They have to make sure that the <clears throat> standards are in place. Well, I don't understand. If they would have relied on local journalists, you retards would all just be claiming that i shouldn't call them retards you guys would just be claiming that they only exclusively relied on idf reporting and idf biased journalists and none of it was fair anyway like what like why are you pretending like that would have made it any better why are you pretending like you would have believed that anywhere also part of the big deal with this story was that it wasn't being widely reported on yet that was part of the thing about this investigation it didn't seem like many people had picked up on this thread yet Place. They have to ensure the accuracy. They have to make sure that people are aware of the rules of, you know, journalism. And um, and so, uh, you know, it's not it's not unheard of or even unethical to work with inexperienced people if there's a sufficient, you know, oversight of the process. And that happens all the time. So I don't I wouldn't necessarily ding them on that. But but um, the New York Times has endless resources. They could have brought in not only they couldn't have, I mean like you're suggesting they could have hired local stringers who were very experienced, connected, would have known how to do this, and already had a base familiarity with some of the problems of some of the narratives. And and you're right to flag that. Um, or they could have brought in a reporter that was really experienced in investigating, um, you know, crime, sexual violence crimes in war. Um, and so. How many of those reporters do they have? How many reporters are there that are incredibly experienced investigating sexual crimes in war? That seems like a pretty niche or pretty narrow field of expertise would be my guess. Neither of those things happen, but what's, what's, what's kind of wild is they start this thing, and, and according to the podcast interview, Anat Schwartz says that she um, initially didn't want to do it, um, that she didn't want to look at images of it, and that's completely understandable. I think she was probably assuming she was going to be having to sit face to face with uh, people who had uh, been, you know, the actual victims of sexual violence um, or rape, um, or uh, or to, to, to talk to witnesses who were going to be describing really horrifying, um, you know, events. Um, but eventually, she says the Times convinced her to do it, and she starts off by calling 
um, all of the hospitals in Israel. Uh, she says she calls 11 hospitals in Israel that each have what are called Room 4. Uh, room 4 are, are specially designated um, uh, facilities and hospitals for victims of, of sexual violence or uh, or rape, and um, and is calling other uh, rape hot, crisis hotlines, etc., and is kind of astonished that all of them are saying they have they had no recorded cases of sexual assault from um, October 7th that came in. And at one point, she says, she describes her conversation with the manager of a sexual violence hotline, and, and it almost sounds like she's just kind of like, not berating him, but just like exasperated and saying, how is this possible? Um, you know, what are you talking about? What do you mean no one? Um, and then she comes across this uh, this um, interview uh, that was uh, was given on uh, to you know, a person who gave an interview to a number of uh, television networks in the U.S. and around the world uh, who was identified as a special Israeli special forces paramedic uh, known as G. Um, and he did interviews with his back turned and he described um, encountering a scene um, in a kibbutz where there were two uh, teenage girls that he encountered that uh, appeared to have been raped. He, in fact, said that they were raped. I don't know how he would have necessarily known that just by walking in, but he, he said that they were raped. The New York Times, when they reported the encounter, um, and he did interviews with his back turned, and he described um, encountering a scene um, in a kibbutz where there were two uh, teenage girls that he encountered that uh, appeared to have been raped. He, in fact, said that they were raped. I don't know how he... You don't know how... What was his interview again? Was he one of the guys... Can somebody link me the thing with the guy with his back turned? Is he... I just want to listen to a thing real quickly again. Enter a home, a home of a family. And while we're looking for injured people, civilians to rescue, as we are in combat there by terrorists that are still holding houses on their own people living there as hostages. And I open with my team one of the rooms of that house and I see two girls lying, one on a bed, one on the floor in their own bedroom. And the girl, 14, 15 years old teenager, she's lying on her bed on, on the floor, on her stomach, her pants are pulled down, and she is half naked, her legs are spread out, wide open, and there are remains of sperm on her back. Someone executed her right after he brutally encountering a scene um, in a kibbutz where there were two uh, teenage girls that he encountered that uh, appeared to have been raped. He in fact said that they were raped. I don't know how he would have necessarily known that just by walking in, but he, he said that they were raped. The New York Her pants are pulled down and she is half naked. Her legs are spread out, wide open, and there are remains of sperm on her back. Someone uh, known as G, um, and he did interviews with his back turned, and he described um, encountering a scene um, in a kibbutz where there were two uh, teenage girls that he encountered that uh, appeared to have been. He, in fact, said that they were. I don't know how he would have necessarily known that just by walking. Exit down. And she is half naked, her legs are spread out, wide open, and there are remains of sperm on her back. Did he just not, who, what is, which one is this? I know he's one of the authors of this. Jeremy Scahill. I think he was involved in two of these articles, wasn't he? He was. He was involved in this one. I think he was one of the three authors, yes, on this one. Lead on the byline, too. Was he involved in the first one? No, he wasn't. That was just bogus Lawn Grimm. So he's involved in two of I guess he just doesn't bother to listen or, or read. I don't know. Maybe I take my manifestos too seriously, I guess, when I try to source my shit. Also, I still don't think I have everything 100% right in my manifestos. I try really hard, but damn. Talk, I guess when you hate f***ing Jews, uh, I, I guess you, uh, sorry, I'm getting unhinged. He's, it might not be anti-Semitism, okay? It probably isn't, actually. It's probably um, hatred of the United States. Um, it's loyalty to any enemy, to any U.S. interest, and it's some weird Marxist, like, oppressor, oppressive dynamic. It's not anti-Semitism. No matter how unhinged I get, I don't think it's anti-Semitism. Not yet, at least. It might be, but I don't think so. But, um... Walking in, but he, he said that they were... The New York Times, when they reported on it, did not say that they were... They just described uh, the scene, uh, the condition he found them in, which was one of them had her pants uh, uh, pulled down, and he said that she had semen on her back. Um, Wait, then, wait, so he did watch it. Wait, then what do you mean? What? And that the other one had her boxer shorts uh, uh, ripped. Remember, this happened very early in the morning. A lot of people were in their pajamas that day. Um, and that she had bruising around her groin. Um, and, and Schwartz becomes, according to her own words, sort of instant. Wait, wait, what was that? Wait, what was that comment supposed to mean about they had their pajamas on? One of them had her pants uh, uh, pulled down, and he said that she had semen on her back, um, and that the other one had her boxer shorts uh, uh, ripped. Remember, this happened very early in the morning. A lot of people were in their pajamas that day, um, and that she had bruising around her groin. Um, and, and Schwartz becomes, according to her own words, sort of instantly convinced that this is indicative of a pattern of sexual assault because there were two women, and they were in a room. It was almost an incomprehensible thing that she was saying on the podcast, how you would all of a sudden jump to that conclusion, but it's her words, not mine. And eventually she tracks this guy down, and she tries to validate the story and says she's calling around, but no one has seen anything. And in fact, in that whole 
whole course of that interview, she never uh, she talks about how difficult it is to get a second source, but she never describes actually getting a second source. And when when it appeared then in the New York Times, uh, if you read it, it's a uh, you know journalists can read this stuff, and, and I think just even reasonably smart people can understand the trick that's going on. There's an attempt to present it as having a second source because they say neighbors uh, said that the girls were found separated um, from uh, from their families. Uh, now our subsequent reporting has indicated that that's um, that's not true. They actually, according to the family, um, they the, the girls died in the arms of their mother. Um, and they, they were also dual citizens of Britain, so the, the story- According to the family that knew nothing and saw nothing and, and had no firsthand or like anything? Like they saw nothing. Why would you source? Why do you think citing the family who has no eyewit nothing on the ground Story received quite a bit of coverage, but to just generally sum this up, um, what what it appears is that the New York Times, um, uh, generally speaking, relied on Zaka, the ultra orthodox uh, rescue organization that Haaretz itself exposed as contaminating the crime scenes, um, putting out um, uh, incendiary allegations of atrocities that it turned out had not taken place. I mean, the, the, the atrocities that took place that are documentable and known are bad enough. And Zaka was running around then talking about Zaka and another um, uh, organization. You know, babies put in ovens, babies cut out of pregnant, you know, fetuses cut out of pregnant women's bodies, um, forty babies, um, you know, beheaded. Uh, I don't think Zaka did the 40 babies beheaded thing. Um, there was one person in Zaka that I think had made those other two tweets that Zaka admitted were probably not true. They didn't have evidence for. All these things. So can, can I just, yeah, can I just real quick? Uh, as far as the, the babies cut out of a, a baby cut out of a pregnant mother's um, stomach, that is an atrocity that had happened in the past in Sabra and Shatila, as far as I understand, which was in Lebanon. And it was a- I Oh, and it was facilitated by Israel. Israel was actually the one that did it. Did you guys know that um, in actuality, it's really- crazy um you know how people scream allah akbar and then their shiny vests explode um that's actually idf soldiers that do that um it's actually crazy that after attack on titan came out you know how they, over uh, marley they show you where they fly the ship and then they drop out people and they turn them into titans israel does that except they do it with israeli children and they do it with suicide vests they don't actually turn them into titans they just explode them that's actually israel that does that um in case you guys didn't know EF backed off. and they do it on u.s planes operation of phalanges that moved into the lebanese palestinian camps uh, and and had done untold amounts of atrocities. And as far as the uh, a, a child being thrown into an oven or a baby to the Lebanese Palestinian camps, uh, Sabra and Shatila, as far as I understand, which was in Lebanon, and it was a IDF backed operation of phalanges that moved into the Lebanese Palestinian camps, uh, and and had done untold amounts of atrocities. And as far as the uh, a, a child being thrown into an oven or a baby being thrown into an oven, that also happened in 1948 in Deir Yassin, um, leading up to the Nakba before uh, the Nakba, uh, but as a part of the planned Dalit uh, acts of terror that were perpetrated by uh, Irgun and Lihi. Um, also known as Stern Gang, the, the terrorist militias that uh, inevitably formed, that ultimately ended up forming the the uh, the organization that we know as the IDF. The, the, the Irgun and the and the Lehi were small organizations. I think the Lehi, at its peak, was three hundred members. Um, how many people were in the Lehi at the at the at the at the height of how many people were in this? Can somebody? Size is fewer than 300 members. How many were they were in the Irgun? Why, why would you cite these are the two the two terrorist elements of the pre-Israel, the Yeshuv like terror? By the way, that were almost universally hated by people in the Yeshuv as well. Okay, it's not like these guys had popular support. Why would you cite these two and not the the Haganah that had like? Of their goons members, almost all were part-time members. They were expected to maintain their civilian lives and jobs, dividing their time between their civilian lives and their activities. There were never more than 40 full-time members who were given a small expense stipend on which to live. Versus the Haganah, that was like tens of thousands of people. From 31 to 37, they had eight to 10,000 participants. Paper strength of 75,000 and effective strength of 30,000. Why would you cite these two parts? Why would you cite the, the, the Irgun and the Lehi as being the things that would go on to become the IDF? What an unhinged f***ing take. So it, that planned Dalit uh, acts of terror in 1948 in Deir Yassin, um, leading up to the Nakba before uh, the Nakba. I like how it was like, what happened in 48? What happened in 47? I don't know. Well, there was the, Dan the, there was the Deir Yassin massacre, and then that's what led to the Nakba. <laughs> And then the terrorists became the IDF. What is that telling of history from 47 to 49? What is the the cherry picking of facts there? What the fuck? Nakba, uh, but as a part of the planned Dalit uh, acts of terror. Oh, and the Nakba, of course, is part of Plan D, which was always to happen that every single Arab would be expelled and that were perpetrated by uh, Irgun and, and Lihi, um, also known as Stern Gang, the, the terrorist militias that uh, inevitably formed, that ultimately ended up forming the the uh, the organization that we know as the IDF. 
So it was 100% a case of projection as well. Uh, so so uh, that's, a, that's another interesting uh, framework to operate off of. Projection. Uh, the rapes were a projection from our, pr from our proud days of Leahy and Irgun military dominance. I mean, you know, a lot of people have been saying for a long time that, um, you know, that the, uh, the accusation is the confession in a, you know. <laughs> the accusation, the, I please, please let this end with IDF soldiers are actually the ones in people in Gaza. Please, please, please. When it, when it comes to a lot of Israeli um, actions, um, you know, but overall, and I, I promise to let Ryan speak too, but just to, to close the loop on this, um, you know, there, there were a couple of, uh, of specific cases that were identified. Are we going to get into any of the factual analysis of like the UN stuff or the New York Times stuff at all? The Irgun wasn't 40 at a few thousand at its peak. Okay, the Irgun might have been bigger than the Leahy. I know the Leahy, I'm pretty sure was like 300 or smaller because um, I remember talking specifically to Benny Morris about this um, because, oh, let's see. Begin was the leader of the Irgun at one point, and um, Leahy was, there was a member who would become, fuck, which future Israeli, it was either prime minister or defense minister was part of the Leahy. I don't remember who it was. Shamir. Troll F. Leahy. It was. Okay, thank you by the New York Times in terms of like you know, a description of an individual victim rather than people who claim to be witnesses saying, oh, I saw this rape occur or I saw these things happen or we saw um, you know, a, a genitalia that appeared to have been mutilated or, uh, you know, or, or damaged or attacked in a, you know, in a violent manner. Um, and one, you know, one case was this case in, uh, in the kibbutz with the two teenage girls and the other was, uh, was the story of Gal Abdush, uh, known as the woman in the black dress. Um, and now they're gonna talk about how her story is clearly fake because family members that didn't see anything that weren't there that are British, <laughs> sorry. Whose own family members, some of them have challenged the New York Times Characterization and also said that um, they were approached under false pretenses to cooperate. The per the lady that said that they were approached under false pretenses, by the way, was never or wasn't even interviewed by the Times for the article. By the way, but uh, let's leave that fact out. In, in the interview in the story, and Ryan knows more about uh, about that than I do. But does he though? Does he know anything about this? Um, you know, what, what we, we sent last night uh, Hassan the the New York Times um, a quite lengthy um, letter laying out some of the problems, and we did this uh, last week with the other story too. And you know, I, I, I think that we've hit a point in this, and you know, many people before us have reported on some of this stuff or pointed it out, but we've, we've hit a point where it's overwhelmingly clear that retractions are in order. Um, if not the entire piece, certainly. And some retractions um, have occurred, right? Uh, as far as I'm no. like, oh, wait. I no. What retractions? No. No. There was a, a, well, one thing that is like close to a retraction, I guess, is the daily piece that uh, came out. Well, that's different though than the print piece. The print piece has a correction on it. It's only to correct uh, the the age of one of the the so-called witnesses in the identified in the piece. But they've issued no correction, no retraction to that actual marquee piece. The, the Daily yeah. Show, the, 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 show, the Daily Podcast thing. That's that's in Ryan's lane, and that's that's a remarkable story. The the so this trio uh, of Adam and Ott and and Jeffrey also published a piece together on December fourth, which is key to this entire thing because December fourth is the day at Kirsten Gillibrand, Cheryl Sandberg, uh, and the uh, you, the Israeli ambassador to the United Nations went to the UN and launched this PR campaign, basically attacking feminist organizations for not condemning Hamas for a systematic campaign. The PR campaign. What do we call every, like, never mind. Uh, the next day, Netanyahu came out and made that exact charge. Uh, Biden, that evening, made that, made that charge. That trio at the New York Times that day published a story. The headline was something like, what do we know about sexual violence on October 7th? And, and you read the story, and it's basically we don't know anything. We're, we're in, they'd been investigating it at that point for almost two months. Uh, and it was clear that they hadn't discovered anything yet. But there's, a, and this goes to your point about the correction, they did report uh, that the IDF had collected reams of forensic evidence that it was analyzing that would stand up yeah. all of the charges. That, you that you mean the internal being... police, right? Uh, I thought is Israeli police. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, just, yeah. it basically just said Israel. Like yeah. Israeli authorities have collected like enormous amounts of forensic evidence. And so when Kirsten Gillibrand and Cheryl Sandberg are coming after the feminist groups, they're able to look at the New York Times. The New York Times says it is. <sighs> We're at two twenty-one. How long is this dog shit fucking conversation? Where the government was was attacking. So uh, a fracturing. Um, not anyway. I'm banned this guy if he can if he wants to. Yeah, but they didn't for. I would say directly responsible for October 7th, handling, uh, handling uh, uh, American citizens. It just consistently escalates, and then that fascism comes back and, and ends up. Pearson, Jill Brand, and Cheryl Sandberg are coming after the feminists. They're able to look at the New York Times. The New York Times says there's just incredible amounts of forensic evidence that are going to be analyzed. December 8th or 9th, four or five days later, and you can, people can go look at the story now, there's this correction appended at the bottom of it that says an earlier version of this story uh, said that Israel had collected enormous amounts of forensic evidence. In fact, uh, Israel has eyewitness evidence that will be rolling out in the future. In November, Anat Schwartz had written so, so, solo byline a story said there were tens of thousands of witnesses. And so from the, from the Israeli perspective, they were telling the world, we have all of this evidence. By despite Hold on. I feel like I remember that quote. When they said tens of thousands of witnesses, 
wasn't that of all violence and sexual violence? That wasn't just of sexual violence, wasn't it? Can somebody find that quote, the tens of thousands of witnesses? Israel promised that extraordinary amounts of eyewitness testimony. Investigators gathered tens of thousands of testimonies of sexual violence committed by Hamas. We were saying the quoting of the Israeli police. Okay, hold on. Can somebody find this quote? I thought I saw this quote initially. Okay, so the quote here is investigators have gathered tens of thousands, those are the parts in quotes, of testimonies of sexual violence committed by Hamas on October 7th, according to the Israeli police, including at the site of the news resource. Okay, so this quote is accurate. I haven't seen this one yet, though, because I haven't read this article. I wonder if that's listed anywhere else in here. It's an ongoing investigation, he added, so it said a team of investigators have gathered tens of thousands of testimonies from survivors and witnesses of the attack, as well as soldiers. Oh, shit. I wonder if the, I wonder if whoever did the picture and the quotation on this, I wonder if the picture guy fucked this up. Investigators have gathered, so the picture quote here is, investigators have gathered, quote, tens of thousands, end quote, of testimonies of sexual violence committed by Hamas on October 7th, according to the Israeli police, including at the site of a music festival that was attacked. But when you go down in the article, the quote is, quote, we are investigating sexual crimes against both men and uh, against both women and men perpetrated by Hamas terrorists, end quote. Mr. Benyamin said in an interview with the New York Times, quote, there were violent rape incidents, the most extreme sexual abuses we have seen of both women and men. I am talking about dozens, end quote. And then quote, this is an ongoing investigation. I cannot get into details. End quote. And then, Mr. Benjamin said a team of investigators had gathered, quote, tens of thousands, end quote, of testimonies from survivors and witnesses of the attack, as well as from soldiers and emergency medical workers. I don't know if when he said this, if he meant, or if, even if where this quote comes from, is tens of thousands of testimonies about rape or sexual assault. I wonder if the picture guy here, uh, up hard <laughs> but it's possible also that the that the police did say that that the israeli police did say that that is possible though to be clear maybe this isn't a fuck up and maybe the idf or not the idf would be the police did f up in reporting that um no mention of any of that i'm sure though on any of this here but thousands of witnesses and so from the from the israeli perspective they were telling the world we have all of this evidence by just by early december they had really convinced the world that this was true, that th this campaign at the UN you know, really worked. And it, it came at a crucial time uh, for, over the, regarding the war effort. Then they start to say, actually, we don't have all of this evidence. So, you know, people start pushing back on it by mid, mid to late December. And then in, in late December is when th that trio comes forward with their Screams Without Words piece. They really just put the exclamation part to, mark down and say, look, this is it. We've got it. Anybody, anybody else who's still asking for evidence is just a rape denialist at this point. Yeah. Um, so actually, yeah, no, actually, I'm so sorry. You're right. That doesn't make any sense. Because how could, um, <laughs> this doesn't actually make sense at all. If he says there were violent rape incidents, okay, the most extreme sexual abuse we have seen of both women and men, I'm talking about dozens. How could you have tens of thousands of witnesses for dozens of rapes? That doesn't make sense at all. That's like, it, it, it that's in incomprehensible. How do you have tens of thousands of witnesses or testimonies for dozens of rapes? Also, how many people were at these festivals? How many people at Nova Festival October 7th? There are not even tens of thousands of people here. <laughs> Wait, what? Oh, but this could be, th you know what I bet this is? When it says tens of thousands of testimonies from survivors and witnesses of the attack, including soldiers and emergency medical workers, this is probably for the entirety of the October 7th attack, like in all the areas. This is probably that. 100% that's what this is. What a weird and stupid um, framing by Ryan here. 
beyond beyond the New York Times, something happened uh, yesterday where uh, the United Nations sent a team of nine specialists alongside, uh, her name is uh, uh, Prima Patel, I believe, to, to go on a mission like to investigate uh, to investigate the the sexual violence and sexual assault allegations that uh, were were made by the Israeli government, and I looked through it. Uh, I also relied on other journalists like Evan Hill looking through it as well, um, and and their summarization of it. And the way that originally this this uh, report was was presented in the media with the headlines, I fear was very different than what the report actually had suggested. Uh, there was an air that it was like presented as though this was an investigation, which it was not. The report itself clearly indicated that it was not an investigation whatsoever and that an investigation actually should occur, uh, that they were demanding that the uh, Israeli authorities open um, uh, or, or, or conduct. I love how carefully we're caveating to the exact boundaries of what this thing could technically determine. I wonder what they said about the South Africa case where it was like, oh my God, probably a huge, I'm, let's check. Ryan. Grim genocide. Twitter, ICJ, South Africa. Breaking. So he's retweeting this guy ostensibly in support of him. Here you go, here. ICJ ruling, oh, is this an article that he's written or somebody else? Oh, Jeremy, the other guy. ICJ ruling on Gaza genocide is a historic victory for the Palestinians that Israel vows to defy. Oh, we've already read this dog shit fucking headline. Holy fuck. The 17 judge panel at the International Court of Justice in The Hague issued a series of rulings on Friday about Israel's conduct during its war. No, what? It had this was not an evaluation of Israel's conduct. Very specifically, oh, I can't. Okay, it is intentional. It is intentional and these people are evil. These people are evil. Okay. I'm past that. Okay. This is not accidental. Okay. To be clear, not only was the ICJ not looking at any war crimes, okay, technically not even the war crime of genocide. What they're looking at is a contravention of Israel's obligations under the Genocide Convention, which is technically a separate thing than an ICC defined, uh, I believe it was under Article 7 maybe, uh, war crime of genocide, okay? That, don't take my opinion on that. Um, like, hold on. Um, Just to be clear, for the limitations of what the ICJ was asked to investigate, okay? Um, I'll just read both of these quotes, all right? The court is not asked in the present phase of the proceedings to determine whether South Africa's allegations of genocide are well-founded. Um, this is just going over the plausibility standard, essentially. Um, oh, fuck. I don't think I quoted this part. I just remember reading it. The, the ICJ and the South Africa case is not about investigating war crimes or conduct of the Israeli military. It's only investigating stuff relating to um, if they're failing to meet their obligations under the Genocide Convention. I don't think I highlighted it here in my quotes. Fuck. Oh, no, wait. It, never mind. I'm sorry. It is in this first quote. The court is not asked if it was part of this. <clears throat> At this stage, the court may only examine whether the circumstances of this present case, as they have been presented to the court, justify the ordering of provisional measures to protect rights under the Genocide Convention, which are at risk of being violated, before the decision on the merits is rendered. For this examination, the court need not address many well-known and controversial questions, such as those relating to the right of self-defense and the right of self-determination of peoples or regarding territorial status. The court must remain conscious that the Genocide Convention is not designed to regulate armed conflicts as such, even if they are conducted with an excessive use of force and result in mass casualties. This determination had nothing to do with military conduct or conflict. It only has to do with Israel's and the Palestinians' rights under the Genocide Convention. 
So when we say a series of rulings on Friday about Israel's conduct during its war against uh, Gaza, that is not true. It was not a significant legal defeat either. They just said that the, that the ICJ thought that South Africa had basically standing to, to do this case. It found that there is a basis to proceed with the case against Israel for genocide and that South Africa had solid foundation. No, it said they had plausibility, which is not necessarily solid. Remember, the court is not asked in the present phase of the proceedings to determine whether South Africa's allegations of genocide are well-founded. That wasn't, the, the goal was plausibility, not, not whether there's a solid foundation. Bro, I don't care. I can't, I can't, I don't, I can't, I can't fact check every single claim it, like every single thing said is like a lie or, or a gross exaggeration conduct an investigation alongside the actor that it was like presented as though this was an investigation which it was not the report itself clearly indicated that it was not an investigation whatsoever and that an investigation actually should occur uh that they were demanding that the uh, israeli authorities open um uh, or, or or conduct an investigation alongside the the uh, i mean are, are by that logic i mean are any fact-finding missions investigations like, would we say the same thing about the, like, the Goldstone Report? Or would we say the same thing about any other UN fact-finding mission that just goes on the ground, interviews people, and then reports things as facts? The Office of Human Rights uh, from the UN, um, something that the Israeli government has obviously been reluctant to do, and as, as a matter of fact, considered the UN to be uh, outwardly hostile to Israel and anti-Semitic. Hmm, I wonder why. Even suggesting such an investigation occur. Um, and yet, the report itself, from what I saw, was almost a, a uh, rehashing, with one exception, uh, but almost a, a, a complete uh, reiteration of the, the New York Times Screams Without Words article. Uh, they went to the same exact sources. They actually openly state in the report itself that like a lot of those sources had uh, also made erroneous claims, and yet they still went to those sources. They went to the same exact sources? They literally say... They, they... What was it, like 33 different, um... In Israel, the mission team conducted a total of 33 meetings with Israeli national institutions, including relevant line ministries such as foreign affairs, welfare and social affairs, health and justice, including the state attorney general's office, as well as the Israeli defense forces, the Israeli security agency, uh, and the Israeli national police in charge of the investigation into the 7th October attacks. They met with the president, the first lady. The mission team conducted several visits to the Shura military base, the morgue to which the bodies of victims were transferred, as well as one visit to the Israeli blah, blah, blah. They reviewed over 5,000 photos, 50 hours of which from the attacks, both provided by various state agencies, independent private sources, and through an independent online review of various open sources to identify potential instances and indications of conflict-related sexual violence. They, uh, the mission team conducted interviews according to UN standards um, and methodology with a total of 34 interviewees, including with survivors and witnesses of the October 7th attacks, released hostages, first responders, health, and blah, blah, blah. The mission team also met with families and relatives of hostages still held in captivity. W where is the idea that like they, they only interviewed the same people from the, the New York Times news article? Um, there was some open source investigator. There was one open source investigator that uh, that that looked through thousands of, of pieces of imagery and uh, found that um, there was at least circumstantial evidence to imply potentially that sexual assault had occurred, um, which was most sexual assault evidence is circumstantial, especially when the person who got raped is dead. You fucking buffoon! What do you think? Yeah. Unless you've got a video recording of the person getting raped, of course it's all going to be circumstantial. And pieces of imagery. Um, there was some open source investigator. There was one open source investigator that uh, that that looked through thousands of, of pieces of imagery and uh, found that um, there was at least circumstantial evidence to imply potentially that sexual assault had occurred. Um, which was again, it, this is as far as I understand, almost identical to the New York Times reporting on the matter. That like no, there's no hard uh, evidence. There's no like actual two eyewitnesses. Uh, Why not actually talk about what that means? There is no hard evidence. There's not going to be any hard evidence for basically every murder rape. You've usually got one witness who's dead. And then you've got the accused who doesn't have to testify against himself. That's super standard. Any murder homicide or any rape, any rape murder is not going to have any direct evidence unless somebody recorded it. Operating the information at all. Almost are these the Muslim standards? Are, are we seeing Hassan's true cultural Muslimness shine through here? Where, oh, you want to make a rape accusation? You need at least two men or four women to testify to it directly? What a f 
ridiculous statement identical to the new york times reporting on the matter that like no there's no hard uh, evidence there's no like actual two eyewitnesses uh, corroborating the information at all or any kind so, of and, like at what point in human history have we ever demand um uh, bro <sighs> i need like a i need a second hot chocolate he's there these all three of these people are actually evil people i don't think i could make it in this world i need to go i need to do a terraria playthrough this is like unhinged like every single thing about this reporting is, uh, when have we ever, could you imagine in any other circumstance, right? If a Palestinian woman got raped and I'm like, excuse me, do you have two eyewitnesses for that, bro? Do you have two eyewitnesses for that rape? Huh. Do they see the d going in, dipshit? Two, you don't have two eyewitnesses? Huh. A rape kit? Yeah, more like a came in her kit, okay? You don't know she was raped, motherfucker. Where are your two eyewitnesses? And of uh, uh, eyewitness testimony, uh, was was basically uh, was was uh, coming from parties that had shown that they had lied in the and uh, on the events uh, of October seventh. Only a couple of those were called into account. Also, keep in mind, okay. Keep in mind whatever circumstantial evidence that you have here. No good. Doesn't count. Who cares? Maybe just her panties burned off, okay, and she happened to die on her back with her legs open. It's a natural position, maybe for a lot of women to be in. I guess they're sluts. They're Jews, maybe, right? Maybe that's where we're accepting, right? But to refute the evidence, oh, well, hearsay evidence from family members that were 20,000 miles away on the bucket shores of Antarctica, that's good as gold, right? For the Abdush girl or whatever. I know for a fact that she wasn't raped. How do you know? Because her British relatives in Cambridge put on an Instagram story saying they didn't think it happened? What? I mean, originally, with one exception, and that was that yeah, they I said. Remember, okay. ahead, sorry, sorry, well, the one exception is uh, that uh, they said that there was there was different clarifications, or there they basically laid out in the report that there were uh, uh, like there was a different classification for claims that they were making. Circumstantial implied that they did not have like hard uh, evidence. It was not beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, Do you think you're primed by all the videos we saw? What the fuck am I primed about? If I'm not, you're banned. I if I'm making an argument that's irrational or illogical, point it out. I, we, we've, I've read so much on this. Actually, fuck, hold on. No, yeah, I'll just leave that. If you think I'm wrong about anything, state a fact, okay? Put a fact out. If you think I'm wrong about anything, put a fact out. I am primed. I'm primed because I just spent eight hours reading dog articles and digging through every single source of a source of a source where almost all of the underlying information is misrepresented at best and just outright fucking incorrect at worst. Yeah, I am primed. I'm primed to think that these people are shoddy hack journalists that are ideologically partisan and biased in one direction. And now they're giving me the most unbelievable reason to not believe any part of this, which by the way, the UN and their fact finding shit, right? I don't necessarily believe the UN either. You just read the underlying material. If you disagree with the material, for instance, when I say the Goldstone Report. I don't say fuck the Goldstone Report because it's the UN or because I didn't like the report. I don't like the Goldstone Report because I think there's a misapplication of international law. I think they try to apply a mens rea intentional element to some of these really killings of family members without even interviewing anybody in the IDF, which makes it literally impossible. I think that the um, taking uh, at face value word on the ground for Palestinians who have also reported that they get killed for being collaborators is suspect at best, right? These are the reasons why I don't trust that. I don't just say, oh, fuck the UN. I don't like the UN, so I don't trust them. No, we go through the report and we say, these are the reasons is why I either do or don't trust these particular things. By the way, not everything the UN says is right. Not everything they say is wrong. So you go and you do a reading of the underlying material to evaluate if you think it's right or wrong. If you think I'm triggered or just primed to hate something, then give me a fact. To, to convict anyone. Sorry. But it was, you know, it was still in their opinion support that there were, uh, uh, like there was a different classification for claims that they were making. Circumstantial implied that they did not have like hard uh, evidence. That's not what circumstantial means. That's not what circumstantial means. It was not beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, to it's beyond a reasonable doubt is for a criminal conviction. That's a 99% standard. That's correct, Hassan. A UN fact-finding mission is not gonna have beyond reasonable doubt for literally fucking anything to convict anyone but it it's not meant to convict anybody remember the cause the standard that they listed was literally a, a, a um, probable cause which would be enough to issue a warrant for an arrest they literally say that at the start at the front of the document but that's standard it's just a fact-finding mission it's not a, it's not a, it's not a it's not a court that's ruling on matters where it's heard evidence that where both sides have presented a case he's just throwing out random legal words this guy just watched law and order svu and turned his stream on circumstantial implied that they did not have like hard uh, evidence it was not beyond a reasonable doubt uh, to, to convict anyone, but it was, you know, it was still in their opinion severe enough to, to make these um, assertions with one exception, which was where they had firsthand 
uh, eyewitness or firsthand. Is your main problem that the intercept slash Hassan are outright denying rapes occurred or that they're just kind of asking questions about being just, no, my problem is that they're, it's not good reporting. All of the underlying factual stuff that they've cited is bullshit. I don't care. They're, it could be the fact, by the way, maybe no rapes did happen. At this point, I find that hard to believe, but that's possible. But if you want to prove that they didn't happen, it's going to take more than you pointing out a bunch of people with, with Stein in their last name or pointing out that camera makes corrections to a website, therefore we can't trust you know, the head editor, or it's going to take more than, than referencing sites that are funded by pro-Palestinian fucking propaganda. Like you have to give some actual good argumentation. Hassan is incapable of it, and these two are too evil to engage in it. <sighs> testimony they said from hostages that were released that sexual violence and sexual assault had occurred on Israeli hostages in the hands of their captives or their captors um and this led them to also uh make the allegation or make the assertion that um that more of that could be happening currently both, to, both towards women and children so that was the only new information I saw in that uh in that report that I had not seen That's thus far I mean let's let's remember though the the context of this why Pramila Patton was doing this versus you know actual investigators who <laughs> would be in a position to gather evidence, um, interview witnesses, would approach this in a forensic criminal manner, um, is that when the UN was initially going to send a, a team to do such an investigation, the Israeli government um, said, no way, they can't come. Uh, they raised objections. They implied that there were anti-Semites on the panel and people with sympathies to Hamas. And then the Israeli uh, government issued an edict to- I wonder why they would think that in an era where UNRWA has people that were working during the October 7th attacks, in an era where uh, massive- tunnels and shit are, are being found near UNRWA fucking facilities uh, in an era where we've been told for a decade that Al-Shifa Hospital has never been used by terrorists and the hospital and the medical people in there say that it hasn't happened and then you see CCTV footage of hostages literally being taken to the hospital right I wonder why they wouldn't trust anybody to medical personnel at all medical facilities in Israel that they were not to cooperate with the United Nations investigation. Um, and so there was this big blow up between Israel and the office of the UN Secretary General, and it resulted in Israel basically getting its way. And they, so then they send this other team in that doesn't actually have a, a full uh, you know, investigative mandate in, you know, in, in any meaningful way. Um, and so you have to understand the political context in order to understand what came out of this body, that Israel manipulated the process so that this group of people would be the ones in charge rather than the initial team that was supposed to deploy to the ground. Um, and listen, if you want to take this point of view, then fine. But don't ever f cite the UN for any shit that you fucking agree with. Don't be a fucking hack, all right? You either agree with it or you don't. Don't, don't, don't do this like, oh, well, they manipulated this panel and this group of people. Like, I don't blah, 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 blah. Um, and what's interesting in this report, I mean, there's many interesting things, is that they make clear very early on in the report that they weren't really able to do an independent investigation um, at all on the ground and that they, they didn't have access to almost anything. Because keep in mind that they're discrediting Schwartz completely because of three tweets that she liked on October fucking 10th, right? On a day where there conceivably still could have been Hamas terrorists raping women in kibbutzes still that hadn't been kicked out yet. She was liking these tweets, right? That's what they're using to discredit her is three liked tweets, I believe. Everything that was being fed to them was coming through Israeli state institutions. And um, yeah. if is every single thing that was being fed to them was coming through Israeli state institutions. They didn't do any they didn't do any interviews on their own. That was just a lie. So when they said that they conducted these interviews, that was a lie or. Was it that was it did Israel prep these interviewees or. In fact, they don't really use the word evidence in there, except in cases when they're describing why they don't call have it information. Uh, they call it information. Yeah. Um, but they have information to suggest. Now, you know, all over the internet and the headlines. Challenges in the collection of evidence. These include limited survivor witness testimony, limited forensic evidence due to the large number of casualties. Potentially valuable evidence. They don't talk about evidence in here over the collection of valuable forensic evidence. The absence of comprehensive forensic evidence. This was commented by evidence being spread among various agencies. Um, <clears throat> available circumstantial evidence may be indicative of some form of sexual violence. Okay, there's a quote about evidence. It is generally agreed that clear and convincing information or evidence rises above reasonable grounds to believe, yet falls below beyond reasonable doubt. Uh, this is talking about standard of proof. Though the material provided by national agencies appear to be authentic and unmanipulated, it could always be independently verified, or it could not always be independently verified by the mission team. Efforts were made to verify the most important piece of digital evidence gathered by the mission team. 
National authorities face numerous challenges with the collection of evidence. I guess you could be saying that they're saying they couldn't collect evidence. Um, how many times did they use the word information in here? 81 times. Sensitive information shared with the UN. Aimed at gathering, analyzing, and verifying information on conflict-related sexual violence. Sets of information received regarding allegations. Open source information analyst. It's such a weird statement to make. Lines and everything. I mean, the way you know, it, it's the, the way this has been interpreted by many news organizations and um, you know, just online people would would fail a basic book report in fourth grade. You know, <laughs> what that what an ironic fucking statement, Mister. The UN's massive win for South Africa. Israel massive condemnation of being genocidal. I mean, you know, it just it fails basic test of reading comprehension. Um, sure, I agree. You have. Um, you know, most of, as you point out, most of what uh, is contained in this 24-page uh, report um, is uh, it's like a great a, a, a list of all the Israeli government's allegations that it's made over the course of the months, all of which were sort of distilled into the New York Times piece by Gettleman, Schwartz, and Sella. Um, there, you know, there are a couple of cases though, and and I think this is 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 interesting, where the UN said that it looked into it and it can find no. A basis or evidence yet to uh, to prove that any sexual violence occurred in places where it had been alleged. Um. Okay. Just curious. Let's see. Okay. There is an issue, by the way, of collecting evidence. Those issues have been clearly laid out in every New York Times article. Okay. Let's see if they mention any of this. Um, religious desire to bury corpses. <clears throat> General mayhem of the day. Um, Zaka. Uh, ineptitude. Slash misguided sense of respect to not collect evidence. Many corpses. Charred. Beyond recognition. Limited time for fact-finding mission. Let's see if any of these five reasons are ever brought up, or if they're just gonna say they couldn't find evidence and then leave the implication to the viewer that there was none. Let's see if they brought up any of this. Oh, bonus meme. Booby-trapped corpses. <laughs> let's, see if they, let's see if they mention any of these six things a single time, okay? into it and it can find no reports and sell um, there, you know, There are a couple of cases though, and, and I think this is, is, is interesting, where the UN said that it looked into it and it can find no uh, basis or evidence yet to, uh, to prove that any sexual violence occurred in places where it had been alleged. Um, that doesn't mean it didn't, but what the UN is saying is that they looked into it, even in the peripheral way we're talking about, and they've determined that there isn't sufficient grounds to say definitively that these things occurred. Uh, None of this report was about saying definitively that anything occurred. That's not the standard of proof of any fact-finding mission ever by the UN. It's not an investigatory legal system body that does that. So that's, you, that statement was nothing. You just said nothing. You just failed your fourth grade book report. Um, and, and they do mention the, um, uh, they don't call it lack of credibility, but the um, erroneous statements that were made by certain individuals. But overall, what this is- That's it? The only thing that they're gonna reference from this report is two misleading statements by Zaka volunteer, right? Am I wrong? Were there more misleading things or was it just the, there was the one Zaka volunteer that lied about the fetus in the pregnant woman um, and then the um, potentially another rape, I think two. This guy lied. Even Zaka said that he pr probably wasn't true. Is this gonna be the only thing they mention? The only reason why it was difficult to collect facts is because of the liars, because of the Jewish liars? Is that, is that the only thing we're gonna mention here? This was a great, great victory for Israel because they were able to launder the narrative and to put the stamp of the United Nations yeah. on it and then to weaponize that. I mean, I've been blasted all day long. Ryan and I, oh, rape deniers, rape deniers. You know, a prominent documentary filmmaker sent me a note. Are you going to apologize? Um, you know, it doesn't matter. Facts don't actually matter. The narrative matters. And that's the whole point of Hasbara, the Israeli propaganda doctrine. You know, it's not about the facts. It's about convincing external audiences to buy your lies. What and what is the lie in here? What 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 part of this was not true or a lie? He's about to lean back and do the Finkel smug. Oh, I could see it. He's, it's coming. Matters, and that's the whole point of Hasbara, the Israeli propaganda doctrine. You know, it's not about the facts; it's about convincing external audiences to buy your lies. Yeah, yeah and the, 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 the irony is that they, so they, the story that we did uh, just just recently is about you know, Kibbutz Beret, where a spokesperson uh, for that kibbutz said that, hey, you know, good for the New York Times for uncovering what they did, you know, when it comes to sexual violence around the country. But in this kibbutz, uh, their story is inaccurate. That that was that was incorrect. 
you know, they told us they told us that on the record, and that's the story about the one that. Jeremy what was their evidence for that? When they said it was incorrect, what did he say exactly? Was he did he witness anything personally? Did he do an investigation himself? Did he connect you with an investigator? Or is he telling you that he was told this? Is this hearsay that's completely baseless? I like how he says, on the record. <laughs> on the record, by the way. It was on the record. It wasn't on the record with anybody that actually saw what happened. God, how fucking cringe. Oh my God, it's like people role-playing as journalists. Holy shit. Fuck. Fuck. Sorry. But in this kibbutz, uh, their story is inaccurate. That that was that was incorrect. And, you know, they told us they told us that on the record, and that's the story about the one that Jeremy was talking about earlier. With also, hold on, I'm sorry. When they say spokesperson, said the kibbutz spokesperson. What does that even fucking mean? Macau, can somebody find out who this person even is? What does a spokesperson for a kibbutz even mean? <laughs> if anybody can find this, I'd be curious if somebody could show me. I'm just curious what the... the with the two girls who, who were killed. And interestingly, the UN report says that two very high profile incidents in kibbutz Bure were, were found to be unfounded. So they, they went they went further than just like, we couldn't uh, establish them. They, they pretty effectively just dismissed them as possible. Uh, one of them is the, the this hoax about the, the pregnant woman with the fetus. And... Is this the second time they've referenced these same stories? They really like these two. Is this the second time we've, we've um, we're referencing these exact same two debunked things? Fetus is beheaded and the mom's beheaded. Like, like that didn't happen. Uh, and then another one they describe as um, the, this hoax about the, the pregnant woman with the fetus and fetus is beheaded and the mom's beheaded. Like, like that didn't happen. Uh, and then another one they describe as um, a, a, a girl uh, who had, had been thought to have been a victim of uh, sexual assault, but it turns out a bomb squad had moved her body away from her family. And so then when, uh, when another paramedic came across, across the scene, saw this girl separated from the family, and this became a very high profile case. Now, they don't say... Uh, which precise case this is like it's a very thin document and it, and it would be nice if the UN would tell us which case they're talking about New York Times very interestingly in, in their write-up of the report uh, mentioned that two in high profile incidents in Kibbutz Bure were, un were deemed to be unfounded by the UN but then they added the Times wasn't referring to either of those but it's completely unclear like how the Times can make that claim and we don't know yet and this requires more, more investigation but they, they also said uh, the UN also said we did we could not substantiate any sexual assault in Kibbutz Bure and the New York Times like we said had three uh, victims that they identified that they elevated as victims of, of sexual violence to establish their, their their claim of pattern and two of them were in kibbutz beret and this the un report seems to align with what the kibbutz spokesperson told us Ryan, let me let me throw something else in there i mean hassan just to give you a sense of like you really need to get this right i don't think i could talk i don't know i could talk to him i think my conversation should be unhinged and if he sees any of my stream tonight he's not gonna want to talk to me he said he might have time tomorrow but i don't know now it's gonna be an unhinged conversation i can't dude this is how meticulous we were when we were approaching this we we went and we put together um you know an excel spreadsheet where we we cross-referenced data on every single minor uh 18 and under and in fact in some cases we went up to the age of 20 just in the interest of fairness because you know uh, uh, just just to try to cast a wider net and and we looked at um uh, we, we created entries for each uh, victim that day and anything that we knew about the circumstances of their death, their age, their gender. Um, and then we cross reference it with the Israeli government's official uh, list of the dead on October 7th, with then the National Social Security Agency in Israel's list of the dead. Then there is uh, each of the kibbutzes uh, or many of the kibbutzes that were attacked that day have their own memorial pages. And then we also cross referenced it with the list of Haaretz and other major Israeli news organizations just to ensure that we didn't miss anything. And in looking at this case that Ryan is talking about, we can't really identify um, any other child that would remotely fit that description that the times mentioned in this piece so you know it may sound like this stuff is in the weeds and people would say well why are you focusing on on, on on just this look at all of these other horrifying atrocities that happened well we're talking about the most important news organization on the planet we're talking about the most consequential article that that news organization published during the course of the scorched earth genocidal bombing campaign and attacks against gaza we're talking about a news organization that played a key role in getting the united states into the war in iraq that has had um, uh, played a, a, a role in multiple U.S. wars, and this article came out. Remember, uh, right in the you know in the sort of aftermath of the exchange of captives between Hamas and the Israeli uh, government, and it came out at a time when Israel was under pressure, even from some of its own allies, uh, because of the massive civilian death toll. Where you had you know that leaders of France and Canada openly saying, "Stop killing babies." 
Um, and so, you know, this this story uh, was was like a, a shot of you know, it was a boost in the arm for the Israeli war narrative, um, and that's why it matters. It remember because- that. Remember their narrative. Okay. Remember their narrative. Okay, is that Jews control the New York Times and that Jewish lobbyists and propagandists have basically manufactured rape stories so that American media, controlled by the Jews, by the way, okay, are are putting out fake Jew stories in order to to manufacture support for the Jewish war machine in Israel. That's the narrative that they're running. Don't be confused. That is the narrative. Okay. Jews in Israel have made up things for Jews in America to manipulate the Jewish media in order to manufacture support for the Israeli war effort. That that's the story. That is the narrative that that these three are fully subscribed to. As uh, the this paper has the ability to take lives with its uh, with its reporting and to influence policy. This isn't just about you know two individual people and whether or not this or that happened to them. It's about the New York Times and um, this story that we're talking about came to the New York Times and other news outlets via the Israeli government. The Israeli government spokesperson, Elon Levy, set up these interviews with this, uh, this you know, paramedic, yeah. so-called paramedic. And um, and in fact, you know, this is I'm sure there's because you, you, you have an interesting audience. I'm sure there are people that have been following this. But just quickly, um, when he first was the first interview this paramedic did that we can find is on a right wing Indian television network, Republic. And his back is turned and he's describing the scene. And the first thing he says, he talks about he, how he was at his fiance's house. And then, you know, all of this started going down on October 7th. And he describes how uh, from Tel Aviv to the Gaza Strip is only two hours by car is. Did they bring up any of these things yet about how it's difficult to gather evidence? No, they're not going to mention any of it, you think? We're just going to try to attack the... Real is a small country. And he says, we then arrived at Kibbutz Nahal Oz. Not not Deiri. Mm-hmm. Nahal Oz. And he's, he describes the scene. And he even goes as far as to say, uh, Nahal Oz means river of strength, river of courage. He's giving sort of color and detail about it. And then he tells the story of encountering these two girls. And he says that they had been raped. Well, the Israeli government spokesperson then puts this up on Twitter, except... He changes it. It's no longer Nahal Oz. Now it's Kibbutz Biri. And one possibility here is that they realize there's a problem with the narrative because they really couldn't fit the description of the victims. Hold on. Can somebody find me the original video with the guy with the back turned? Did they really change this initially? Or like, because now he's implying that the Israeli state media is warping the already fake story that they've manufactured. They realize like that lie isn't going to work. So we got to change the lie. Biri. And one possibility here is that they realized there's a problem with the narrative because they really couldn't fit the description of the victims to Nahal Oz. There are two sisters that were 20 and 18 years old that are the closest you could, uh, you know, maybe think, but it, it, it seems clear that they real either the, either he misspoke, even they though he gave the, this the description of Nahal Oz. Right, right. Um, or uh, they realized they had a problem with the narrative, and so they put it out, and he clips that part of it out, puts it online, and says it happened in Kibbutz Biri. And by the time he's then on CNN and, and, and interviewed elsewhere, uh, Kibbutz Biri becomes the story. And by the time Anat Schwartz comes across it and meets with this guy uh, for the New York Times piece, it is firmly um, uh, rooted in Kibbutz Biri. Okay. Um, so one thing that I think we should all, I think we all agree on this as well, that we should mention here is the fact that um, sexual violence is a common occurrence in war and in situations like what happened on October 7th. Um, and he's gonna he's gonna say Israel rapes a lot of Palestinians too. It's coming. I know it's coming. It's got to be coming. It's got to be coming. It's got to be coming. Or uh, Israel rapes a lot of uh, Palestinians in jail. It happens all over the place. That there is a likelihood that sexual violence did occur on October seven. Um, however, this conversation is not about the likelihood of sexual violence occurring, but rather the the in- oh the systematic. Okay, he's doing the. It's about the systematic investigation, routing. or rather lack thereof into sexual violence occurring, a proper investigation into sexual violence occurring, and a lack of forensic evidence and a lack of evidence in general. I just want to- Oh, never mind, okay, he's just, he's just saying nothing. Is he, is he gonna bring up any of these things about the forensic evidence stuff, or any of this, or? That out, yeah. so that people don't misunderstand or try to misconstrue this. Um, yeah, and, and especially people systematic should also... and weaponized sexual violence directed by Hamas. Uh, and and uh, I think people should also understand that, that there were at least several hundred uh, people who kind of poured across the, the fence uh, on October 7th, uh, there, there are reports of basically like gangs coming over and taking advantage of the situation. Like you can imagine, you've, been, you've never left Gaza your entire life and, and uh, now the fence is down. Um, people were just pouring over that border. And so I don't think people should be dismissive of the idea that in the context of, of that mayhem and violence, that there could have been some sex- sexual violence. In fact, it's, it's interesting. If you look at the UN report that the media kind of spun up. To... What is the, what, do, what is even the, what is even the, like, hold on guys. It wasn't just Hamas that was raping people. It might have just been ordinary Palestinian like citizens that came over and were fucking doing tons of rapes, okay? Like, what do we even... That sounds like a far-right Netanyahu talk. That sounds like some shit I would expect Ben Giver to say. You guys thought Hamas was raping Jewish women? No, just normal Palestinian citizens. That, what, do, 
what is this talking point supposed to bolster? Or that there was just so much mayhem, some Palestinians like tripped and all their dicks landed in some charred f***ing Jewish corpse? Well, like what the f*** are we even trying to argue here? Say, to semi-agree with this like Hamas weaponized rape as a weapon of war claim. You look at the way they actually phrased it, they said something like, you know, in the context of the violence on October 7th, it is reasonable to believe uh, that sexual violence may have occurred. And like, if you're first in, like, if the first thought that goes through your head is, oh my God, the open wall, maybe I can go rape a Jewish woman. Maybe the wall needs to be there. Maybe that's the strongest argument for the wall separating Gaza from Israel. Maybe that, like that framing of it, I think is, yeah, that is sure. That's reasonable to believe. And the next question is what, what investigations have been done? What is the evidence uh, that we have so far? And so you can, you got to kind of separate those two things. And then the third thing being a deliberate Israeli run PR campaign to persuade the world that there was a systematic weaponization of, of sexual violence on October 7th. Uh, and then walking they kind of make kind of make that presentation to the world and then they just slowly back away that anybody who asks them evidence to back up their claims is told that they're you know, an anti-semite and a rape denier I mean, some of the part of the problem part of the problem with this um and i i, I appreciate you bringing this up hassan i mean uh, and, I, and ryan and i both have been very clear from the beginning and making the same point as you and as someone who's covered you know multiple wars um i, I know very well how prevalent sexual violence is i mean w you know women women get targeted look, look at what happened also like in the arab spring uprising in egypt you know you, you had women being assaulted um you, in protests in the united states you have women being assaulted the un just did a report about the israelis assaulting palestinians in their uh in their prisons um you know and, and there are first hand accounts for that one by the way and right. yes finally yes we can talk about the jew rape yes yes Yes, we got there. I just blew my fucking load. Yes, we got there. Ah, oh, I've been edging to that one for so long. And, and evidence. Right, there's a higher, yeah, well, Palestinians are gonna be held to a much higher standard of evidence. <laughs> Kill. Uh, in their prisons. Um, you know, and it, there it, are first hand accounts for that one, by the way, and, right, and evidence. Right, right. There's a higher, yeah, well, Palestinians are going to be held to a much higher standard of evidence than, than the Israeli government when they're making these kinds of allegations. But I also think that one of the, the, um, one of the factors we need to really recognize here is that when, when a nation state organizes a propaganda, propaganda campaign, and they make these kinds of allegations in the in the absence of concrete evidence, and, and they're doing it in an attempt to dehumanize an entire population to justify killing them, they are... Maybe, what if it was accurate though? Is it dehumanizing to just like say what happened? Also simultaneously doing a disservice to any potential real victims of sexual violence. Oh my God. Because they are they are uh, using this as a political cudgel. They're using it as a genocidal cudgel rather than treating it as a criminal investigation that needs to be pursued. You know, one thing I've noticed and I think actually Hassan, you and I talked about this last time we-, we Do you think they would talk about any of the reasons why it's difficult to do investigate? I love how we've got, you know, two and a half journalists or one and a half journalists, I don't even know what these guys all add up to. All these journalists here and not a single one so far in 20, 30 minutes of this, even though it was brought up in the first New York Times article, even though it was brought up in the second New York Times article, even though it was brought up multiple times in the UN report, none of these guys, not a single one, have spoken about why it might be difficult to collect forensic evidence. Not one time. We, we hung out here. Um, if you look at the tone, of the actual sex crimes investigators in Israel when they're interviewed. There is a much more sober, fact-oriented uh, manner in which they talk about this. Um, because they're professional investigators of these types of crimes. They understand the complexity of it, the nuance of it. They understand the psychology, uh, the horrors that, that set in with a, someone who has survived or witnessed a rape or a sexual assault. And the tone of those people who are professionals is, is, stands in stark contrast to the jingoistic propagandists of the, uh, of the Israeli regime. Um, and I think it does a disservice to an, uh, an actual inquiry into uh, any of these kinds of acts that may have taken place that day. But the, the person who is whose words constitute the headline of the New York Times piece, Screams Without Words, Roz Cohen. Now, there's problems about his story, and we can get into that if you actually want to, but that's not the point I'm making right now. He says, uh, he finally settled on a narrative uh, for, for what he witnessed, um, where he says that the people that he witnessed committing um, a, a very brutal gang rape were not Nukba, not special forces of Hamas, um, but ordinary people. And he's a veteran of the Israeli Special Forces. He said that in the very first story. He said they were dressed in civilian clothes. Why do they keep saying this guy changed his story? Raz Cohen, he said he saw five men wearing civilian clothes. Why do they keep saying he settled on a narrative? When did it ever change? So he's saying that they very clearly were not Hamas, yet his- That's clothes. not true. You don't know if they're Hamas or not. You just know they weren't. they were wearing civilian clothes. Hamas wears civilian clothes sometimes, motherfucker. Even Amnesty International has said as much. Even your beloved fucking UN organizations have made these exact same fucking claims.
Did I cite this for the um I don't know if I had this for my Finkelstein argument or not. Do, 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 do. All of this just comes from a 2009 MC International product. I thought about loading up a ton of them for, uh, but I figured, I, I, by the way, I didn't get a single one of these fucking quotes out, so. Hamas and other Palestinian armed groups also violated international humanitarian law in their conduct within Gaza. They launched rockets and located military equipment in Amnesty International, July 2009. Uh, Gaza, oh shit, I copied the wrong part here. They also used empty homes and properties as combat positions during armed confrontations with Israeli forces, exposing the inhabitants of nearby houses to the danger of attacks or being caught in the crossfire. Let's see, the armed ring of Hamas and other Palestinian armed groups based in Gaza launched rockets and mortars on a daily basis into towns and villages in southern Israel. Hamas and other armed groups also endangered Palestinian civilians by failing to take all feasible precautions for the conduct of their military activities, notably by firing rockets from residential areas and storing weapons, explosives, ammunitions in them. They also mixed in with the civilian population, although this would be difficult to avoid at the small and overcrowded Gaza Strip. I think there was a thing um, about them wearing civilian clothes. I'm trying to remember if that came from that 2009 report. The group openly acknowledged that their fighters and military facilities are present in towns and villages in Gaza, but argued that their role is to defend their communities against Israeli attacks and invasions. Fuck, I didn't include it in here. Might have been in a 2014 one as well, but. Screams without words becomes the title of an article whose thesis is that Hamas did this. Hamas you yeah. know, came in with a systematic plan. I mean, yeah. the, and, you know, so even though- What is this argument? that Hamas came in and did this, but it wasn't just Hamas, it was ordinary Palestinian citizens? Their own, their own witness in here is saying something that is, that's contradicting the thesis and his statement is used as the headline for the article. I think Hamas is used as a blanket thing for like Palestinian aggression from the Gaza Strip. Like, I think that's just like the blanket word. This is, I wish I would have been familiar with this before because Rabin uh, or Rabani, um, Muin tried to catch me on this when I was talking to Finkelstein uh, and him. We was like, you said Hamas, but some of it could have been Palest uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, the attacking people. Like, do you want me to say Palestinians? Does that sound better to you? Cool. Yeah. yeah. Hassan, let me add one more thing that, uh, about how I've, I've been thinking about this. Like, so on, on the one hand, it is incredibly remarkable uh, that there isn't a single uh, Israeli <clears throat> woman who has made a claim that she was sexually assaulted on October 7th. You have, you have a lot of people who say, oh, I wonder if they're gonna bring up, it's crazy that he would say that. Isn't it weird that people haven't come out and said anything? Isn't that kind of strange? Like, if, if all this stuff had been happening, why aren't more people coming out to be excoriated? I think that's the word, right? To censure scathingly. Why haven't more people come out and said something? Why is there, why aren't more people coming out? I don't understand why more people aren't coming out and, and reporting something. The lack of trust by survivors of the 7th of October attacks and families of hostages and national institutions and international organizations such as the United Nations, um, as well as the national, and, the national and international media scrutiny of those who made their accounts public hindered access to survivors of the attacks, including potential survivors slash victims of sexual violence.
While the mission team met with a number of released hostages, it noted their well-founded fears about the risk of revealing their stories, which may result in their identification and further harm to them, as well as to those still in captivity. The mission team further noted the fact that the identities of some of them have been publicly disclosed in both national and international media, often with their names and photos, which has contributed to some choosing to remain silent. Did you, did they even read any of it? Like, why, why isn't that brought up at all? Well, to say single uh, about how I've, I've been thinking about this, like so on, on the one hand, it is incredibly remarkable uh, that there isn't a single uh, Israeli <clears throat> woman who has made a claim that she was sexually assaulted on October 7th. You have, you have a lot of people who say, why don't you believe Israeli women? Well, Wait, also, hold on. Not a single woman has made the claim? That's not true. They just don't want to, I think the thing is they don't want to talk to media, right? Because the claim is that they're being, um, they're in therapy or traumatized or some shit, which may or not be true or whatever. But um, the mission team was made aware of a small number of survivors who are undergoing specialized treatment and still experiencing an overwhelming level of trauma. It did not meet with any survivor such victim of sexual violence on October 7th, despite concerted efforts encouraging them to come forward. Um, this is implying that there are some rape victims that are in therapy or some bullshit or whatever. I don't know, it, maybe that's true, maybe that's not true. But to say that there are none, like... Zero Israeli women have, have come forward. So some people said, well, you're setting the bar too high. So I'm, not, I'm not setting the bar too high. If, a, if an Israeli woman comes forward no. with a credible claim, uh, that's, all we're, that's all we're asking for when it comes to a credible complaint. Then people say, well, of course, they're not still around. Uh, you know, they have been, they have been killed. And, Maybe that's true. Uh, but what I add to that is... Maybe that's true. Do you want to go over? How many times do they put in this report? There were over 100. The mission team was able to determine that at least 100 bodies had destructive burn damage, preventing any findings of what may have occurred to those individuals, including any assessment. Of, I like it. He's like, maybe that's true. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe. They're not still around. You know, they have been, they have been killed. And maybe that's true. Uh, but what I add to that is that's where Israeli claims of having reams of video evidence, photographic evidence, and forensic evidence come into play. They made that claim throughout, all throughout November, that they, that they had collected that evidence from these victims. The fact that they never have turned over that evidence and now are making these bizarre claims that they don't have the evidence because of Jewish burial traditions. and th like th th The kinds of excuses that should not have even gotten. Wait, the, the, these are, okay, so they kind of brought this up, but they used it to impute. I don't, did, listen, if the IDF claimed they had forensic evidence, then them, okay? They shouldn't have made that claim. That was a bad and stupid claim. If they made that claim, I don't know if I've ever seen that substantiated other than that one New York Times photo that looked stupidly labeled because I don't think that's what the underlying quote was saying. Um, but if they said they had eyewitness testimony, they're not losing eyewitness testimony because of burials. This is a non sequitur. That doesn't even make sense. Now we're making these bizarre claims that they don't have the evidence because of Jewish burial traditions and like th the, the kinds of excuses that should not have really even gotten past an editor. Like, no, no, go back to your source. That's, that's, not, a, that's not a serious excuse. And, and also, we reported two weeks ago that you have so much forensic evidence. What happened? Were you lying then or are you lying now? So that's, that's what I say to people who have a, a very reasonable follow-up when they say, well, of course no women have made that accusation because then they, they, were, they were killed on that day. How can, they, how can they make an accusation? Well, then you have to go back to Israel making the claim publicly that they had the evidence that would prove it. Yeah, now mountains, no longer saying that they have Mountains of forensic evidence and first-hand accounts and like uh, first-hand testimony that is not conflicting with one another. Um, right. Yeah. So the only thing that we do have actually a, a rigorous standard uh, applied for is basically... Um, the claims that were made that were later falsified. That's the, that's the, the craziest part about the story. Like, I Is that the only part of this? So none of the parts where the mission team felt like they'd found strong evidence of um, sexual assault, none of that is gonna be talked about. It's just gonna be those two instances. By the way, um, I don't know if it's a good idea or not, but this is why Israel says they don't like to cooperate with international investigations. This is why Israel doesn't wanna cooperate or work with anybody else, because why the f would they waste their fucking time, right? Because of shit like this, which I don't necessarily think is a good idea from the Israeli point of view. But, you know, maybe they should have higher cooperation with people like this. But I mean, like, this is why. I said, with one exception, um, where we don't have any evidence, uh, at least public evidence, but uh, claims made uh, by, by uh, Israeli captives, hostages. Because the UN report, like I said... The mission team reviewed incidents of alleged sexual violence related to hostages in Gaza. Based on the first-hand accounts of released hostages, the mission team received clear and convincing information that sexual violence, including rape, sexualized torture, and cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment occurred against some women and children during their time in captivity, and has reasonable grounds to believe that this violence may be ongoing. Um, this, was a, this was for hostages. Um, <clears throat> 
at least 10 distinct corpses displayed indications of bound wrists and or tied legs. Um, a minimum of 20 corpses with partially or fully exposed intimate body parts, such as breasts and genitalia, resulting from the absence, displacement, or tearing of clothing. Um, but... Uh, if, if you notice, if you notice in that report, there's a there's a huge di difference in tone between you know what the UN reports about what they know about uh, host the hostage situation and what they know on October seventh. October seventh, they say, in a broad context of violence, it's reasonable to conclude that something happened. Like very very low level confidence. When it comes to the hostage thing, they say there's there's clear and convincing information. I think is the phrase. Yeah, yeah because those people are still alive. Overall, based on the totality of information gathered from multiple and independent sources the different locations, there are reasonable grounds to believe that conflict-related sexual violence occurred at several locations across the Gaza periphery, including in the form of rape and gang rape during the October 7th, 2023 attacks. Credible circumstantial information, which may be indicative of some forms of sexual violence, including genital mutilation, sexualized torture, or cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment were also gathered. In a broad context of violence, mean, you know, what the UN reports about what they know about. Uh, host the hostage situation and what they know on October 7th. October 7th, they say, oh, in a broad context of violence, it's reasonable to conclude that something happened. Like, very very low-level confidence. When it comes to the hostage thing, they say there's there's clear and convincing information, I think is the phrase. Yeah. It's much they higher, yeah. which they, they uh, openly admit is a much higher standard that they applied right. in that situation, like first-hand testimony is what they have which for that. Which is what we're asking for, right? Yeah. Um, and there is a one, I guess, out of, like, I've been uh, looking through every single instance and, and all of the hostage testimony that has come out, uh, and I remember that... And what he means when he says that is he's seen people that he agrees with tweeting about it. Even before the original, uh, even before the big uh, seven day uh, cessation of hostilities where there was a hostage swap that occurred, uh, there was an older hostage that had uh, given an impromptu interview to the media, which was very was heavily uh, criticized internally in Israel. And, and the person, the hospital uh, 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 person that allowed this to happen uh, was, was actually, well, I don't know if they're still let go, but they were. So now Hassan is going to run with the narrative that the IDF, that Israel or Shin Bet, whoever the f or the Mossad um, is prepping all of the released hostages. Every single bad thing the Palestinians have ever done is fake, and it's Mossad IDF propaganda. And they were mad that one hostage said the real story and truly reported what happened, and they didn't prep that interviewee enough. They were sent out uh, on an extended hiatus um, for, for and, and you know heavily criticized, heavily scrutinized. But I remember in that original uh, in that original uh, uh, hostage testimony uh, that was broadly publicized. Uh, there was one instance where one of the hostages that was they were like, bro, it was chill. We were just hanging out. They let us play. To be fair, it was only a PS3, not a PS4, but it was still chill. It was awesome. Carried into Gaza, was reportedly uh, hit with straws and, and was humiliated and, and also uh, sexually assaulted in that regard where people were like uh, hitting her with uh, people were hitting her in, in the I don't know how to talk about this as a, in a delicate way in her butt. Basically, I, I remember something uh, along those lines, which does meet the standard of sexual assault. Oh, never mind. Okay. That's better than I thought. Sexual violence and also uh, ritualistic humiliation. Um, beyond that, beyond that, I have not seen any public uh, hostage testimonies that corroborate. So I don't know if uh, the I UN team there was is. One, there was one I think today or yesterday in the Guardian, uh, where where they said that they had spoken to other hostages yes. who had been abused by previous by previous yes. captors. And that's the kind of like firsthand, or like, I guess that's secondhand by now, but it's that person spoke firsthand to the victims. Like that's the kind of credible testimony that that you want that the public wants so that we can get yes this answer. I mean, I so that what you can tear these people apart and try to point out the 52 million contradictions and they're like i think i think also what we're gonna you know if, if there's really a historical reckoning with all of these events and 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 there is a proper tale of what of, of all that happened and facts actually matter i think part of what we're going to see is that when hamas launched what they called operation Aqsa, al Aqsa flood um you know, they had certain objectives in mind. They had certain tactics in mind. Uh, they were working with uh, at least four other po uh, armed uh, factions from Gaza, including Palestine. He's not going to say that, like, this was a strictly military operation and they targeted military bases. Please. Oh, God, he's not going to. He's not going to say that. And in Islamic Jihad. Um, and then, as Ryan indicated earlier, you had a variety of private actors, um, some of whom or many of whom may not have even been aware until it had already started that, you know, the prison fence had been broken and, um, you know, there was an attack happening inside of, uh, of of Israel. And, you know, Hamas itself said, uh, if you recall, during the, the, the first um, truce where there was the exchange of captives, um, that it wasn't able to locate every single hostage. Well, the reason for that is because um, Hamas wasn't holding every single hostage. Islamic Jihad had some, other political factions had some, but then private people also took them and then tried to sell them to Hamas or other um, organizations. And so, 
you know, it, it's it's possible that, uh, I mean, at this point now, I think all of the hostages' lives are in grave, grave danger because of the Israeli um, assault, uh, the lack of food From and famine. supplies in Gaza. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a horrifying situation for every grave, grave danger because of the Israeli um, assault, uh, the lack of food From and famine. supplies in Gaza. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a horrifying situation for everyone in Gaza, including the, you know, the Israeli yeah. uh, uh, prisoners. Um, but the point I'm getting at here is that um, you can have, on the one hand, a narrative from certain people who were held hostage that were released where they're describing um, pretty humane treatment at the hands of their captors. There it um, is. In fact, in this piece in The Guardian, um, that, that came out, I believe it was today, uh, this this released hostage is describing how um, her captors at one point put mattresses over them and put their own bodies on them to prevent them yeah. from get, getting hit by shrapnel from their own country's uh, munitions that were being dropped on them. Um, there have been many... <laughs> what? <laughs> what? If that's the case, if that's the case that they're protecting the hostages, they're not protecting them out of some goodwill for their fucking fellow man they're probably protecting them because the hostages are valuable chips or tokens to exchange with israel what an unfathomable fucking statement holy shit testimonials about uh, uh you know being treated humanely although it was difficult and many hostages released said it was really terrifying when uh you know that their, the israeli government was was attacking so I don't and the, uh, the mo what, what's the most terrifying part about being a hamas hostage it's the idf <laughs> i can't bro i bro i want to there's so much unhinged shit <sighs> I don't mean to babble on and on about this, but I think it's a, it's a, it's an important distinction if we care about facts that there is not, there's not just Hamas. There there are there are several different players here, and what what I suspect is that um, if if you were able to divide who was taken by whom, that you're going to hear different tales of how they were treated depending on who was who was holding them. Yeah, um, one really important. Um... So to recap, um, hostages taken. It wasn't always by Hamas. Okay, ordinary Palestinians are also fucking unhinged. Apparently, that's point one. Point two is if you're a uh, if if you're a hostage, you'll be taken great care of because they love you and they care for you and they'll do everything they can to keep you alive. Even throwing their own bodies and mattresses over you to protect from uh, you know enemy attack. And when you are a hostage by Hamas, the scariest thing is always the Jew. Okay, it's the IDF is actually the scariest ones, by the way, but part that stood out to me in the Guardian article that you guys are referencing is actually um, the, the hostages that said that they had heard uh, of accounts of sexual violence uh, that, that some of the other captives were subjected to. They wanted to bring it up to the Hamas commanders who they, in their own words, said were, would be very receptive to listening to what they had to say. Um, so that, once again, reaffirms the exact same position. Now, you might not think that... How much to sell Hassan to Hamas? What, can we all, dude, can we facilitate this exchange? If it's such a great condition, if it's such a great way to live, like, go party there for a little bit. And not the Hamas in Qatar, okay? The the, or Qatar, not the, the Hamas that lives in a, in Gaza. So I want to be clear there, okay? Not not the ones that live in their four million dollar mansions in fucking Doha, okay? The ones that uh, you know are actually Gazans. It is because uh, these guys care about the humanity of the hostages. After all, they did violently kidnap these people, right? Oh, um, but, you know, you're a valuable <laughs> I love that they violently kidnapped them. Exactly. Even from the perspective of of like being a rational actor. Uh, every single person that that uh, was a part of the operations on October 7, um, which, of course, uh, was was very violent and had a, a, a massive civilian death toll, still had a rational interest in uh, taking hostages, not simply in the words of Israel to, like, take them back to Gaza and, like, humiliate them and rape them or or, or kill them, but instead to use them as leverage in on the conditional release of Palestinian prisoners. Very rational. One of the videos I watched yesterday, by the way, the Israel army has now released no one care about you several days ago very rational by the way and in this very rational by the way um, you think anyone's in here uh, the IDF claims that uh, let's check no 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 was during that music fest in which uh, many were seeing uh, running seeing you know no 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 cover no nope. and uh, this video uh, what about this one hold on uh, uh, kill some civilians over there maybe uh, in fact were killed. very rational by the way also can I? Okay. Okay. Words matter. Okay. Hamas was not indiscriminately uh, killing civilians on October seventh. Okay. That is not true. Indiscriminate implies inability to choose targets. Indiscriminate usually implies a level of recklessness. It implies a lack of distinction. Uh, it implies poor proportionality. It might imply unable to be aiming certain uh, uh, munitions. That's what indiscriminate means, okay? Uh, 
Hamas was intentionally targeting and killing civilians. It was a discriminant attack and that they were discriminated between military and civilians and they were choosing to kill them anyways, okay? It's not, an in, it's not indiscriminate in the sense that they were just killing whoever they blah, blah, blah. They were killing civilians very specifically. They were very specifically targeting and killing civilians, okay? Just, yeah. I, I don't even know if I like the word indiscriminate being used there. It was, it was a high level of intentionality to kill civilians. It wasn't just reckless attacks and bombs, blah, blah, blah. It was killing civilians. You don't stumble upon a party of festival goers and are like, okay guys, shit. There might be undercover troops here. Let's go. <laughs> like including high profile Palestinian prisoners as well. So that I think is the, um, that I think is like something that's lost in the, in the media narrative for some weird unforeseeable reason that like these guys are barbarians and they're not thinking in a rational manner at all. There's no calculation here. They're just purely responding to their primitive desires of like. This Israel army has in this video that you can see on your screen, um, Hamas militants, uh, the idea right. claims that, that they've seen the, um, indiscriminately that I think is like firing at lost bathrooms. In the, in the media narrative for some fest in which weird, unforeseeable reason that like, these guys are barbarians and they're not thinking in a rational manner at all. There's no calculation cover. here. They're just and, uh, purely responding to their primitive desires of like raping Israeli women. Because this is this is all, this is the narrative that uh, occupying powers, colonial powers, uh, oppressive you know forces used throughout history. You have to dehumanize not just the enemy in a military sense, but the population that that enemy comes from. You have to dehumanize all of them in order to uh, to justify uh, your actions. And the United States has laundered so many of Israel's dehumanization efforts, um, uh, not just in this, uh, uh, you know, five months of, uh, of, of attacks against Gaza, but all through history. And let's remember too, have people forgotten Abu Ghraib? Have people forgotten Guantanamo? <laughs> the CIA black sites? I mean, the, the United States itself ran a secret kidnap program where it was snatching people off the streets of cities across the world, taking them to... Uh, secret prisons, torturing them, including uh, sexual torture of prisoners, um, and then shipping them off to a gulag where they tried to hold them with no respect for the Geneva Convention, um, you know, etc. So, and, and then you have the reports, not just the sexual violence reports about uh, Palestinians being held in Israeli prisons, but just straight up also physical violence um, and psychological torture of Palestinian prisoners. Um, Thank God we can make this about the Jews killing people and raping people. Thank God. Yes. Those stories that are, are actually documented at this point with facts and evidence, et cetera, um, are sort of, sort of f faded into nowhere. And, and we talk about a lot of uh, allegations and, and the word Hamas is used to, you know, with this broad brush, it might feel good for the narrative, but if you care about facts, then you're gonna actually want to, and you're talking about crimes, then you need to identify specific perpetrators of these crimes. Yeah. Yeah, well, the UN report actually made a point. <laughs> what, what, what does that mean? Like, let's go ask Hamas who we think, who did the rapes? To say we, we, we did not even attempt make any attribution of any of the violence, um, what, distinguishing between Hamas, Islam, and Jihad, or gangs that just, you know, came across the border. Like, they were very clear, like, what we're presenting here is not, we're, we're not claiming that this is this is Hamas. Obviously, Hamas, the one that planned the operation, and none of it happens without Hamas, but, but they were very clear about that. that. You know who you should have on the show, Hassan? I mean, since you got the, since you got the Yemeni pirate, you know, the, the, that kid that went viral all over the place, you and I were talking yeah. about that, that you were able to find him. You know, there's, there's a couple of great accounts online that have been looking at Israeli TikTok videos, but there's, there's there's one really interesting. Oh, account. I really hate uh, you, BM. I really, yeah, BM. You should have BM on. Um, but I mean, there's a bunch of Palestinians that have been doing this too. But I really hate you. Would be. I think that'd be an interesting interview for this yeah. show. It's, it's, yeah, um, but just so your, your audience understands, you know, there's a lot. Of, there's all these Israeli soldiers. They seem to be obsessed with going through the underwear drawer of Palestinian women in Gaza and, you know, dressing up in their lingerie and, you know, it's it's um, yeah. I yeah, mean, I, it, it, I don't know what I don't know what happens there. I don't know what is like the mentality there. But that is a. There are a lot of. Uh, there's a lot of that. I feel like, um, I, I feel like there has been less. Uh, I think that I remember reading a report from IDF command saying that they need to like clamp down on the social media activity of the of the soldiers uh, on the ground, considering that uh, it was becoming more and more of a problem. You also had, on the other hand, uh, the IDF's very own Telegram channel that was uh, engaging in atrocity propaganda for a not insignificant number of people. Uh, it was a it was a version of a much more popular Telegram that's like owned and operated by, you know, other Israeli people and not directly linked to the government. But uh, it was about 72 like virgins, I think. Yeah. 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 Mm. So I think that... Um, the, the IDF at least uh, originally saw a lot of value in in the the uh, horror that they were uh, that they were committing the, the horrible acts of of inhumane violence they were committing in the Gaza Strip uh, from the perspective of like galvanizing the Israeli public uh, so much so that they basically made their own uh, Telegram channel after seeing the success of the other one um, but now it, it does seem like uh, there are less uh, there are less and less uh, Israeli occupying force uh, uh, members in gear uh, openly showcasing their their um, you know endless uh, untold cruelty. It's, it's less violent in the sense that like for a long time you were seeing a lot of like buildings blown up and and, and violence against uh, you know other human beings and maybe the order came down that's like look you gotta cool it and so cooling it means well i'm just putting on some lingerie i'm not i'm not hurting anybody here yeah um just I'm, you know you get the picture of the kid and the guy in the 
in, in laying in a baby crib. Like it, he's not like blowing the house up. Um, yeah. So maybe or, that's or like riding like uh, children's bicycles. Uh, right. Uh, riding children's tricycles. Yeah. Like things like that. So it's, mocking, it's mocking Palestinians rather than actual like video of either destroying their homes or like you know them. you know though that the, that the, one of the characters in the new york times piece is a guy named shoam gueta and he was with that guy Roz cohen at the nova festival and um in the in the in the uh, in the new york times piece you know he's he's um describing himself as having witnessed these events on the anat schwartz um, but then another thing he said i couldn't watch it was so hard so what is it podcast that we translated and transcribed she says that Roz cohen witnessed this but that everyone else who was with him was looking in a different direction but then in the piece he's corroborating he's presented as a corroborating witness to Roz cohen yeah but that guy shoam gueta then deployed with the idf to gaza and you can go and look up you can pull it up right now look up his uh his tiktok account um and he's a fashion designer in in israel and he posted all these videos on uh if you go to if you go in our story on the uh, if you search his name i mentioned this but he's rummaging through palestinian uh houses in gaza how you know, do, one of them he has, is, uh, how do you spell his first name i remember yeah. S-H-O-A-M. Um, but, yeah. Wait, say it again? S-H-O-A-M. Oh, Just, yeah, oh yeah, 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 Shom. Yeah. yeah, you look at him in my, yeah, if you, if you look him up and you pull up his TikTok, this is one of the guys who is, is one of the witnesses in the New York Times piece, uh, Screams Without Words. And then he, um, yeah, so like go to the bottom of that paragraph, go to the bottom of the paragraph there, and then um, you should be able to click on the link because I mentioned that he's been rummaging through Palestinian homes. Um, oh, he might have deleted his TikToks of doing that. Oh, wait, never mind. There are some here still. Let's see. Uh, scroll down and see if there's any of them there. Oh, oh he's, he's peeing. Up. He's peeing. Yeah, like he's... You know, he's then he's like, like dressed up in people's clothes and he's, you know, in their thing and he's dressed up as bat in a kid's Batman costume at one point. And, um, you know, he also created like a T-shirt for his fashion line that says Nova 10-7 and then it has his face on the T-shirt. And it's really, I don't know, it's really disturbing. But yeah, he's he's even posting this stuff too. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. He's and he's like, yeah, he's, no, no, and this, uh, I mean, let's remember too, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about children that are starving to death right now. Um, you know, the imagery out of Gaza is, um, is horrifying. And... Um, you know, you, you have the, the, the catastrophe of pregnant women, um, you know, of the, the attacks against the civilian infrastructure. I mean, this is just an unconscionable, sustained crime. And, and you know, these, these guys are playing with kids' toys, kids that are probably buried under rubble, and they're playing with their toys, and they're taking their bikes, and they're putting on their costumes, and they're playing with women's lingerie. I mean, this is a deeply, deeply sick uh, series of events that we're witnessing. And we're witnessing. It's funny. There's been more condemnation for this retard on a skateboard that i think i heard for the entirety of hamas and palestinians for the entirety of the un fucking rape report i think i've heard more harsh things because of idf soldiers apparently cross-dressing uh wearing batman costumes and skateboarding yeah. it because of social media you know etc they're, they're broadcasting their own sickness yeah, I think uh, one of the one of the most interesting parts about this isn't necessarily like the capacity of cruelty for an occupying force. That much is like obvious, like American soldiers did similar things. They just didn't have the same tech access. American soldiers, Israeli soldiers, any Russians, any Russian or Chinese or Syrian or Yemeni or even like Saudi. Well, Saudi did say because he was anything in the same mass availability of phone cameras and direct access to the Internet. Um, you can only get away with doing stuff like this, obviously, when you are an when you have air superiority and when you're a western backed power when you're white western backed say it Hassan please say it you can only get away with this when you're white and western backed white and backed by America please say it please say it oh god I'm edging I'm edging I'm edging I'm edging so hard right now. hold on this is the biggest cum shot it's coming please 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 say it please don't say something else please don't say it. Please, please say western or American backed please say it and you're overwhelming a largely civilian population uh, it's going to be a little bit different if it, if it were, you know, if there was a role reversal or rather if uh, they were actually fighting an enemy that was evenly matched with their own uh, weaponry and not like uh, an aesthetic force that uh, is, is forced to make, you know, bathtub rocket launchers and whatnot. And still a to success Fuck. despite that uh, asymmetry. Um, Fuck. But uh, what I find to be really interesting. Oh, God. I'm gooning. Now I'm gooning or edging. I'm still edging. Interesting about this is that. Again, there's an audience for this. Like there is a market for this. Fuck. And clearly the Israeli government itself finds this to be valuable enough that they haven't uh, genuinely put a stop. Because this is like, this is something that would violate uh, standards of almost every uh, military internationally. Because you are one, um, giving away your position and, and maybe much more to potential enemy combatants, right? Um, so on that front, uh, I remember something happening in Ukraine that was similar where, um, I remember something happening similar in Ukraine, like with a foreign brigade where we're actually like, telegraphing their location and, and uh, by posting uh, and yeah, then they yeah, got rocket striked. Yeah, they got yes. rocket striked immediately after. So like um, there's there's obviously that part that, that, that violates like the safety for the operatives. But then also um, I think in spite of that, uh, they still see a lot of value in it. Like the IDF sees a lot of value in it because this reinforces, I guess, some of the, uh, I would say sadistic desires from the population overall to, to enact vengeance and, and continue on with an ethnic. The sadistic desires of the population. <laughs> cleansing campaign uh, in, in Gaza. I think there's also a potential for a 
uh, of fracturing, um, not necessarily along Lebanese lines, but I think you're coming out of this war, you're going to have armed factions in Israel um, that are that are not as uh, obedient to the central government um, as they have been over the years. I think that what I think the the radicalizing um, that's going on in the last years and months, you know, could could completely spin out of control. For you, um, you had settlers okay. trying to go in, breaking through right. the border fence and try to settle forcibly inside of Gaza, as there are currently operations that you know, I mean, ethnic cleansing going on in Gaza. This to me uh, shows the the bloodlust that many have inside of Israel. <laughs> Bloodlust. Hold on. Some Israelis going into Gaza to try to settle it, which, by the way, is bad. That that shows the bloodlust inside Israel. But the past hour of talking about uh, Palestinians that were coming into Israel to fucking gang people. <laughs> what the fuck? They take matters into their own hands like it's not enough that they're bombing them with American rockets, with Mark 84 rockets. Um, you know, precision guided munitions and, and a litany of dumb bombs. Precision guide, yeah, dumb bombs. Fuck the precision guide. It's all dumb bombs here, right? As well, like artillery and even white phosphorus, that they have to, that they have to save their bloodlust by uh, by personally taking matters in their own hands. And as a matter of fact, putting themselves in harm's way, not by Palestinians, uh, by Palestinian forces, but by uh, by potentially opening themselves up to Israeli rocket fire. Like the, the Israeli military has killed Israeli hostages that were begging in Hebrew to not be shot, that, that tried to, uh, that, that, you know, tried to escape that were uh, left behind, they killed them. So the, the fact that these uh, settlers that are trying to go in there, in spite of that, is, is insane to me. And it shows that there are a lot of people that are increasingly more radical, uh, yeah. that, that are willing to take matters in their own hands. But look, look at the, look at what, what uh, opinion polls have consistently shown in Israel from the beginning of this across political- Are we gonna talk about opinion polls in the West Bank and Gaza or? Political lines, you know, widespread support, um, you know, in Israel for this war. Uh, this <laughs> crazy widespread support in Israel for a war against Hamas that did the largest terrorist attack in the history of all of Israel. That's bizarro. That's crazy. Just as a quick, just a quick check again. Um, how many? Less than a thousand soldiers dead in the Six Day War. I'm, sure, I'm saying if this is like the lar this biggest, largest single death event for Israel. I'm trying to see how many died in Yom Kippur. Okay, about twice as many died in Yom Kippur. Okay, but half as many, mostly civilians killed in a single day, as have died in arguably the worst the uh, Israeli Arab War. And that people are supporting the the military action in Gaza. Is that really so surprising? Despite the fact that there's tens of thousands of civilians that have been killed, I mean, it's um, yeah. uh, it, it, it's it's an unmasking moment in some ways. Um, unmasking, you know, in many ways. And um, you know, I, Israel really wanted to compare this to 9/11 at the beginning and to, to extrapolate numbers and, and do a comparison to 9/11. You remember the the reaction in the United States after 9/11? You had you know you had this um, this bloodlust that set in across so many sectors of the of the population. Um, bloodlust. You know, in the case of Stri what would it be like if I described Palestinians as having a bloodlust? It's like it's an interesting choice of words, a bloodlust of Israel right now. Um, it, it could well be that what emerges from this is something in, in some ways more dangerous than Netanyahu. And certainly this war and the way the Palestinians have been treated and murdered in, in Hamas um, is, is almost certainly going to give rise to a force that's uh, more radical than Hamas. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's the pattern, we saw, you know, with what gave rise to ISIS, etc. Um, you know, big nation states or powerful nation states, they they uh, they think that they can stamp out the resistance by wars of attrition and mass murder. Um, but history shows that it um, it, 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 it just uh, plants the seeds for um, even more ferocious armed resistance. No, absolutely. I mean, I think people understand that there are former there are so many former Shin Bet internal security uh, people like high ranking officials in the Israeli FBI openly stating that this is only going to cause radicalization, further radicalization. And yet no one seems to listen. And and I think it's uh, it's it's fueled by obviously years and years of propaganda and interest in like developing an ethno state. Uh, a, a Judeo supremacist ethno state and the ethnic cleansing that must happen in order to ensure that. Um, and now, uh, and, and now the, the, the population has found itself in the throes of, of straightforward fascism, uh, while a ethnic cleansing campaign is currently unfolding right in front of their eyes and they are championing it. And I, and I don't think like a lot of, I don't think a lot of Israelis, even like liberal Zionists, for example, um, beyond their, their acceptance of this and what that says about their own morality, I don't think they understand the long term consequences. One example that I've used time and I, you know what? I, res I have a lot of respect for the Nazis. You know what? I feel like Nazis are fucking based because at least Nazis just come out and say what they fucking mean. I miss those people. I miss those days. 
they would come out and they would just say, you know what? I do hate Jews. I don't want to Holocaust them again. And you know what? I think that's, to be that honest is base. It's so much better than listening to this fucking dog shit. It's so much better than listening to this. Oh my God. And time again uh, has been that uh, just like with the parallels we saw, LRAD's long range acoustic devices were originally utilized in Iraq to dispel, uh, uh, to, to stop, you know, civil disobedience occurring. And now those LRADs are equipped on regular patrol cars in the Beverly Hills Police Department being used against American citizens. And the same parallels occur in Israel as well. The skunk, uh, the, the, um, the skunk car that they used to use in, in the West Bank that sprays a chemical, a toxic chemical that is almost impossible to wash off that the Israeli government, the IDF was utilizing on civilian houses and civilian populations in the West Bank were used on the Israeli population. Yeah, the point of using these things is so that you don't have to fucking mow down a crowd. You don't have to spray fucking assault rifle fire into a crowd to get them to stop. Yes, they have bad smell machines. <laughs> Why are we crying about this? Isn't that a good thing? When they were protesting the Supreme Court, uh, when they were protesting the, the, the neutering of the Supreme Court, rather, and what a lot of Israelis do not understand is that the things that you are advocating for will inevitably be used on you as your government becomes more and more right wing. Post 9-11, we had the Patriot Act. Post 9-11, we had the DHS and ICE. These were agencies that, uh, these are agencies that now seem like a permanent fixture of American empire, and yet they did not exist. A much more, uh, a much more neutered version of said agencies existed in the INS, and now uh, we can't even see a world without Bortak. Bortak is operating inside of US borders. Uh, these are guys who are basically uh, being deployed uh, and, and training uh, overseas, and it is it is the same principle behind like having <laughs> and Ryan full laugh. blown occupying. Ryan's like I've heard this episode before, but I'll come back. Fully geared, fully kitted military person inside a U.S. border. Yeah, lethal means genocidal. Non-lethal is cruel and unusual methods to harass and belittle occupants. True. Handling, uh, handling uh, uh, American citizens. It just consistently escalates, and then that fascism comes back and, and ends up uh, destroying the population itself. And then also, yeah, I got Hassan, I gotta, I gotta go pick up my daughter. Yeah, no, this is, uh, we can, this was wonderful. I don't want to take up more of your time anyway, guys. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Jeremy, Thanks, for man. coming on. This was uh, wonderful. Um, um, you know, unfortunately, we end up talking about some of the worst things that are happening in the world, but uh, you guys are doing phenomenal work. And, and by worst things that are happening in the world, we mean always about Israel and America and Ukraine. Yeah, thank you so much for your uh, continued work. That was Jeremy Scale and Ryan Grimm of The Intercept. Uh, Just so you guys know, when Hassan constantly does this thing, he's like, well, I talk to journalists. I don't read a book. I talk to journalists. I, this is what he means when he says, I talk to journalists, by the way. This is exactly what he means. Their latest reporting is very instructive. I covered it extensively on my YouTube page if you'd like to go watch that. Uh, we talked about the UN. Uh, the UN. Did you enjoy that? No, bro, dude, if I was Israeli, I would legitimately, I would think the whole world is fucking against me. <laughs> This is wild, dude. I read all these articles from The Intercept back and forth responding to this New York Times shit. Like every single underlying link is either a lie or it's a fact check that links. To, have you ever heard of that Oct7 fact check site? Uh, and I, I haven't heard of that site specifically, but I've, I've read through quite a bit of the conspiracies. I was um, just curious because I checked like all the facts that they debunked and coincidentally, every single one except for one was anti-Israeli. Huh, crazy. And then I feel it's apparently it's funded by a group called Tech for Palestine or something, but. Anyway, oh, wow. what's up? Yeah, no, I know. I, I watch that. Yeah, it's. it's quite, well, I, I just want to know what his reaction would be if the IDF had a military operation into Gaza. Um, and, you know, there was an investigation that found some rapes happened. But then someone said, well, actually, during the operation, the IDF were supported by settler militias. And, you know, you can't really, you're, you're just blaming this on the IDF, but, you know, the settler militias could have been doing I that. don't know what that talking point is supposed to mean, <laughs> like, because it sounds like an ultra far right Israeli talking point. The idea that, like, even Palestinian citizens are out here raping. Like, that's such a weird, I don't know why they think that saves them or, or, or what, how that's a good talking point right there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know what the motivation there is other than, like, a defense of Hamas. Um, at I don't the expense know. of civilian Gazan civilians, or, or maybe blame it on PIJ. But like PI, even though PIJ's numbers eroded prior to October seventh, so only about one thousand. So our priors are going to be lower for that. But I mean, the main point here is just that this is your fucking operation. Um, you're responsible for what happens. You, you're, if your subordinate belligerents do something, um, for an operation that you designed and orchestrated, you're responsible for that. Like, imagine if no one would accept a rejection of the Sabra Shatila massacre 
because it wasn't technically the IDF that did it. Actually, it was, it, not only were they not rejected, they literally brought that up in this video. They said that that was an IDF sanctioned event. Like, yeah. even though that wasn't even, not only was that not their own citizens, or I'm sorry, not only was that not their own soldiers, it wasn't even their own citizens. <laughs> like, yeah, it was, a, it, was a, it was a subordinate belligerent. That wasn't them. But the, the point is you're responsible for subordinate belligerents that aren't you in your operations. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is, it's very, I, I have no idea what the, I mean, it's just bizarre on so many levels. I don't get the motivation. I don't get what, how it absolves Hamas of responsibility. Um, even if it wasn't them and it was just subordinate belligerents at best. I, I don't, um, yeah, yeah, that, that was weird. Know. Also, it's a false, also, it's a false claim to say that the, there are no women that claimed they were raped. I mean, that, that's just, I, I DM'd you a, a, a link, a t I, I posted a tweet, but it had a link to where it was reported. There's at least three women and one man that have made that claim. It's just that they didn't go to the public with the claim and just do all these media interviews. Uh, yeah, and the UN report even says why they don't want to. Uh, yeah, why they I don't mean, want access to the public, yeah, because of people like Hassan and uh, Jeremy and Ryan, yeah. Yeah, that, that's just factually just the incorrect statement. That's, that's just wrong. It's not true. Um, yeah, no, it, it's very bizarre. Like, the, the whole thing that Hamas is somehow absolved of responsibility for rape because, you know, they they let a subservient belligerent or a, a citizen do it. Um, weird. All, and, like, the part where it's like, well, they didn't do any investigation to find out if it was Hamas. Like, like what, are you, what investigation are you going to do? Like, are you going to ask the, the rape victims, hey, do you know if it was Hamas or PIJ or, like, a citizen who yeah, raped you? Yeah, not to mention that a lot of the corpses are burned, a lot of the bodies are buried, because Israel has retorted oh. religious beliefs. Even if they weren't, people, like, yeah. what, what, is, what is that going to do to, like, <laughs> what, are you, what is that going to do to differentiate whether it was Hamas or PIJ? Yeah. Like, what, what, what exactly, what's the proposal there? Yeah, I don't know, Jesus Christ. Yeah, um really weird <laughs> that's like that was one of the weirder things i've seen you react to um but yeah um hopefully you can understand the perspective of how um and i don't think it's like a you know this i don't say this to be like it's a false but i think there's kernels of truth to it not kernels like there's there's a good amount of truth to it where yeah there are these groups of people that will do anything to israel bad though like yeah yeah off the channel uh, all right i love you buddy